This is an NBC 30 special presentation. Jim Calhoun, Beyond the Bench. Hello, my name is Kevin Nathan, and welcome to this special presentation on UConn basketball coach Jim Calhoun. When he arrived in stores in 1986, there were no Big East championship banners, no talk of a national championship, and the gamble wasn't even built. So tonight we look at how this man from humble beginnings turned a regional basketball program into a national powerhouse. And we'll show you a side of Coach Calhoun you've never seen on the bench. When I think of Jimmy, I think of Norman Mailer, Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, Mickey Spillane, tough. Jim Calhoun was, never had a silver spoon. Jim Calhoun never had things given to him. Tough is the first word. He is a tough guy, but he's confrontational. He's abrasive. He's witty. He's charming. He's intelligent. He's ultra competitive. Anytime there's a competitive chance to win, Jim turns that switch in. If you go play golf with him, he wants to win. He has an iron will. He won't let himself lose. I've often thought that when he, Jimmy was 13, 14, or 15, he never lost a fight because he always threw first. I can't only do it one way. I don't check my emotion, my passion, my commitment at the door. It's a 24-hour deal. He eats and sleeps basketball year-round especially. You know, he's like a different person during the season because he wants to win so bad. He demands everything from his team and from his players and from himself to the point where sometimes he even makes himself physically ill. When some guys show up thinking they're early and it's 6 a.m., he's already been there at 5 because that's just how he is. I'm not a horse player, but if I, if I were a horse player and I went to the track, and there's a jockey named Calhoun, I'm gonna bet on him. I've knocked heads with him, let's say, 30 times over the years, and my record in those confrontations head-to-head, -head, as we speak, is zero, 30, and zero. There's nothing better I'd like to do than to beat him. In order to do that, you better be ready to do it every second. When uh, Jim came, you, you were hopeful to be one of the top four in New England. And now we're uh, not going to be happy unless we're a top four in the, in the nation. The UConn Huskies are the national champions. Words people in Connecticut thought they'd never hear. In his 17 seasons at UConn, Jim Calhoun has won a national championship, seven Big East titles, and the hard-fought respect of his players and peers. Calhoun turned a mediocre program into a March Madness mainstay. My job is, is for three hours a day, if Kevin Nathan was playing for me, is to push you to be the ultimate, the best you can be. Bring out things that you never knew you had in you. It's tough to think of a six foot five inch guy as a jockey, but he, he knows how to ride his teams. Uh, I mean, he just, the thing is too with him, he, he'll ride you from the best player to the worst player to get you better. That's just his, his competitive fire that he has, you know, inside of him. And, uh, the thing about it is it's very contagious. There's always that threshold of pain where you want to stop. And coach was the type that wouldn't let you feel that. And sometimes we found ourselves behind the other team and just kept on pressing. He would never let down. He would always press us. He would always tell us to keep on going. It's always, man, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think we're good enough. And he's just won the championship. Allen with Iverson on and throws one up. And the good people that, that do things really are control freaks. And I say that with a compliment to Jim. Jim is a control freak. He wants everything to be the best for his kids. He wants everything to be the best for his program. So you can get a better X and O person. You can get a better communicator. You can get better things, but you're not going to get a better person at bringing the best out of people. Because he loves the game, uh, he loves the aspects of teaching. You know, a lot of head coaches don't travel with their teams. They go, they go by themselves. Jim is always with the kids. By the end of the year, if you don't want to win the game as much as he does, you haven't been listening. Calhoun's players always know where they stand, especially on game day, when the coach's intensity reaches its crescendo. Two hours before the game, Jim Calhoun enters into a different world. Jim Calhoun on game day is usually not a very happy camper. You know, like a lot of coaches, he gets uptight and he gets ready to go to battle. Up 20 points at halftime, he's coaching like he's down 20 points at halftime. The assistants will tell you that better than anybody. We'll give him a suggestion, he'll yell, he'll think about it, and then if he thinks it's good enough, he'll implement it. A couple times I've tried to back off and I've always had my teams tell me, but coach, you don't care enough anymore. It's been a funny thing because they're so used to my passion. 
He is screaming at the gods about the injustice of the world. But he also likes to have an audience. And he would pick me as the audience. He's talking right at me, but he isn't talking to me. He's talking to the universe, you know. How could anyone do this to us? He's not the guy that you see yelling on the floor trying to get his truth and he's clapping like that. Life is a motion picture, not a snapshot. Two hours during a basketball game is a snapshot picture of who he is at his most competitive moment, okay? And so now you see him doing things and ranting and raving that, you're like, wow, this guy's a little rough around the edges. But 22 other hours, you know, he's, he's a human being and he's a family man. He's almost the exact opposite of what he is on the court. You know, it's, it's tough to, it's tough to get him angry. It's, you know, he's... He made a comment. He said, you know, people, the fans think when I go home, I look at Pat and I start cursing at her and telling her to pass the bleep, bleep, bleeping pillow and this and that. It doesn't mean that I go home and start saying, Pat, get back on defense. If you met Pat, you know that that's not exactly something he tells me. I want you to take the rubbish downstairs. I say, yes, ma'am. I think if they were, we were ever before a judge, I don't, I think the kids would have gone to Jim. <laughs> I, mean, I think they would have said, don't, don't, you know, let me go with him. <laughs> he's, he's such a softy. Jim and Pat Calhoun said their vows 36 years ago. And to this day, they vow to make their two sons and three grandchildren their top priority. He'll do anything and go anywhere just to spend a little time with his family. And I think everything revolves around that. A lot of coaches used to kind of joke about, here come the Calhoun boys, because we were always together. We were always with him. We went to road games. We went to Final Fours. He brings to their world such um, a wonderful role model. Yet Papa, as he's known to his grandkids, still finds time to pursue other interests. He's a great talker about movies or the theater or world events. He's a staunch liberal Democrat. Jim is extremely bright. He's a historian. If we actually kid him because we say he's like, if you're talking about the weather, he's the meteorologist. He's the movie critic if you're talking about movies. And he's the same Jim Calhoun, equally intense with all the answers. When we return, the childhood memories and tragedy that shaped Jim Calhoun's life. You're watching an NBC 30 special presentation, Jim Calhoun, Beyond the Bench. You're watching an NBC 30 special presentation, Jim Calhoun, Beyond the Bench. James Alfred Calhoun Jr. grew up in Braintree, Massachusetts, a blue collar town 13 miles south of Boston. It's the birthplace of John Hancock, John Adams, and the six children of James and Kathleen Calhoun. Jim Calhoun was the third oldest. He was very popular and um he was my best friend during high school. Um, you know, I relied on him a lot. The one thing he had was unquestionable integrity. He never lied. He had it all in high school. He had the looks, he had the, the, the basketball prowess. I played football, I played baseball, I played basketball. I loved football. I loved the contact of football. Hated to get knocked around in football. Hated it. Hated to get knocked on his keys. But basketball was Calhoun's first love. He began playing the game at this modest court in Braintree. He and his buddies would cut through the woods from his house and play here until dark. And today the court bears his name. He and I would play one-on-one -on -one all the time. Every day, almost every day. Um, even if it was raining out, even if it was icy out. And the series was always, he was, uh, you know, it was always like 10 victories to one. Or, uh, he, and he would never, ever give me a, um, an advantage. Everybody in my family is competitive. I mean, we really were, and my dad would never show it, but in his own way, he was very competitive, but he was very quiet. My mother was fun-loving. Uh, we used to kid her, and uh, I think today, if, if, if Shooter, God rest his soul, reappeared, it'd be Goldie Hawn. And, and my dad was probably much more a Gary Cooper. But in 1957, at the age of 45, his father died of a heart attack. Jim was only 15. He went home and his mother was there. My husband was there too at the same end. He went over to his mother and said, don't worry, mom, I'll take care of you. At 15 and a half, that's 
pretty good. For the death of my dad, altered the way I had to look at life. I just felt that now the burden of responsibility was placed upon me. Clearly was a father figure to me in those early years. Because of some people who love me, my family, and Fred Herger, my high school coach, um, and probably some values has been taught to me by my family, uh, I wasn't going to give in. Now that you've got to know me better, Kevin, over the years, uh, I'm not going to give in. Calhoun dug deep to support his family, literally. He dug graves and worked in a quarry, but he eventually earned a basketball scholarship to AIC in Springfield. There, he helped resurrect the program. As a senior, he led AIC to the top small college ranking in New England. He was certainly the leader from the day he got there and uh, brought an com unbelievable competitive spirit to, to the team and to uh, everybody around him. I made up for what I didn't have sometimes as far as spring or maybe sometimes speed with Will. I, I just outrun you too long until you dropped. Calhoun carried those traits into coaching. After four seasons at the high school level, he was hired by Northeastern University in Boston. Calhoun was only 28. And all of a sudden, here he is, our new head coach, brash and bold as can be. And of course, at first I thought, man, I'm gonna have a job sort of taming this guy down a little bit. Uh, you know, he's a little bit over the top, a little out of control. I never tamed him. And we all just got used to him. And all got to love him, too. Northeastern wasn't a Division I program when he took over. He dragged them into Division I basketball, the same way he dragged UConn into the upper level of Division I basketball. And in his 14 seasons at Northeastern, Calhoun delivered his message the same way he does today. He would have these long practices in you. He would talk to you about things and he talked so fast. Half the time we didn't know what he was talking about anyway. We just knew it meant run hard get it done and stay a long time if you didn't get it done. Northeastern reached the NCAA tournament in five of Calhoun's final six years. And in 1985, his Northeastern Huskies beat the Yukon Huskies in the Connecticut Mutual Classic. Five months later, Yukon hired him. And we knew right away this had to be the guy. Yukon, in an amazing turnaround, captures the Big East tournament. Let the celebration begin. When we return, Jim Calhoun transforms UConn basketball and an entire state. You're watching an NBC 30 special presentation. Jim Calhoun, Beyond the Bench. You're watching an NBC 30 special presentation. Jim Calhoun, Beyond the Bench. May 15th, 1986. UConn replaces Dom Perno with 44-year-old Jim Calhoun. I feel UConn has got the pieces. It now has to be put together with time and an awful lot of hard work uh, to once again to head in the right direction. The pieces are here. Not necessarily, you know, if, if this or if that's the when we do this, when we do that. He was quite confident. There was no doubt in his mind that he could get it done here. Now, he's coming to a place that had four straight losing seasons and really had just come out of talk where maybe they should get out of the Big East. There were three reasons I was sure UConn couldn't do what UConn has done. Location, location, location. But Calhoun located talent and convinced them to play in stores. In-state recruits like Chris Smith weren't allowed out and kids without work ethic weren't let in. It was tough. A lot of people just saw us on TV winning championships and getting rings and on television, but it's, it's a sacrifice. That starts from the first day of practice and doesn't end until the last day of school. Uh, getting up at five or six in the morning and running, lifting weights. Calhoun sold recruits on playing against the best in the Big East, and soon their hard work paid off. After a nine and 19 first season, his second team won the NIT. Husky Mania was born. Then came the dream season. In 1990, the Gamble opened. UConn won the first of five Big East tournaments and advanced to the final eight of the NCAAs. Tate George made the shot. Coach Calhoun called the play. It wasn't, you know, how are we gonna do this? He was in fact, this is how we're gonna do this. Burrell, 
takes the ball, looking inbound, loops it far up court for George, who catches it, turns around, shoots, and he got it! Everybody was confident, but I don't know if we were as confident as Coach was, man. All right, here is Leitner with the shot, and it scores! But two days later, Christian Leitner and Duke spoiled a possible trip to the Final Four. A heartbreaking pattern developed in the Final Eight. UConn again fell short of the Final Four in 1995 and 98. The last complaint was he's never made the Final Four. That's like saying Ernie Banks never won a World Series. Everything in my life, if you continue to work right around the corner, is something good. The Huskies turned that corner in 1999. After beating Gonzaga in the national quarterfinals, Jim Calhoun and the Huskies reached their first Final Four. The Connecticut Huskies are heading to the Final Four, finalists. And I was so relieved when he went because the monkey was off his back. The Huskies beat Ohio State in the Final Four, and the national championship matchup was set. UConn would play the Duke Blue Devils for the title, a Duke team that some had already proclaimed as the greatest in college basketball history. They were obviously handed the championship in advance, nine and a half point favorite. He loves to be the underdog. Don't anybody ever get in against him when you're the favorite, because you're going to get it in the head before the night's over. And here's the trick as a coach. That's it. We throw first, even against Duke. Langdon with three. Langdon's going to lose the dribble. He trips. It's over. It's all over. UConn is the national champions. The Huskies have climbed to the top of the NCAA mountain. Yeah, he outcoached them. But I don't think that was surprising. I think he's that great a coach. There was never a doubt in my mind uh, that we won a national championship. Calhoun left the final strand of net in St. Petersburg, Florida, in honor of late team manager Joe McGinn. The coach never cut out of his life the people who helped him reach the top. Right before the Final Four in 99, he called me in my office at work and said, you know, I, you know, I want you to come down and be a part of this because you helped us get to this point. I hadn't played in like eight or nine years. When we return, the Calhoun legacy at UConn. You're watching an NBC 30 special presentation. Jim Calhoun, Beyond the Bench. You're watching an NBC 30 special presentation. Jim Calhoun, Beyond the Bench. Jim Calhoun's impact on the state of Connecticut extends beyond the court. He endorses companies and gives back his time and money to charity. His annual golf tournament raises money for the Calhoun Cardiology Research Fund at the Yukon Health Center. It's a way for the coach to battle heart disease, which took the lives of both of his parents. And Jim's not one of those guys that are gonna go out and, and put up the flag and say, here I am, see what I'm doing. He, a lot of what he does, he likes to do it because it's the right thing to do and he's not looking for recognition on it. Many even believe Calhoun's success led to UConn 2000 and the renovation and upgrading of the store's campus. And I don't have any doubt that that's what helped get all the funding projects for UConn going. But most of all, Calhoun will be remembered for building a UConn dynasty. He's won more than 600 games in his career and the Hall of Fame likely awaits. The names have changed over the years, but the results and the lessons he's taught about life have remained the same. Coach kind of taught me that, okay, you know, you're responsible for yourself now. You know, nobody's gonna look after you. The things you do in the court, you want them to transfer over into real life. If you go on to be an NBA star, fine. If you don't, whatever, you're gonna leave UConn knowing that, you know, he got the maximum out of you. I mean, I wouldn't have earned a PhD without him really pushing to say, hey man, there's so many things you can do beyond basketball. One thing I know is that kids respect the hell out of him. But I also know that the day they leave here, they not only respect him, they love him. If you know him or, 
or you ever was coached by him, whenever you see him, you just want to give him a big hug. He's probably never heard me call him Jim because of the relationship we have and it's a respect thing. It's always coached to me. Love him to death. He was like a second father to me. I call him Pops, you know, because that's what he is to me, a father. I grew up without a father and he's the closest thing to one that I ever had in my life. And nearly all of Calhoun's former Huskies returned to Mohegan Sun this summer for a charity game. I thought it was the greatest tribute to a coach I had ever seen. Say I can snap my fingers and go back to being 18 years old again, I, I would come back to UConn and, and play for coach in a second. Jim Calhoun made good on the promise he made to his mother all those years ago. He has taken care of his family, a family that now includes hundreds of former players and assistant coaches. And his legacy will live on forever. Thanks for watching. And good night, everybody. All great companies and all great organizations have great CEOs and leaders, and you know, that's why UConn basketball has been so good since he's been there. I think he always strove to be his dad in many ways, the pe person that people talk so highly of. And I think he's accomplished that so many times over. He hasn't changed a bit. He's still the same Jimmy. <laughs> he has never forgotten that he went to Braintree High School and people in Braintree were good to him. If he likes you, if he trusts you, if he knows you, he's very helpful. He'll do anything he can to help anyone. No one could ever say, boy, he doesn't care about his kids. No one could ever say he doesn't care about winning. No one could ever say he doesn't care about the success of UConn. Um, and if that's what they say, that's good. He won't be appreciated the way he should be appreciated till long after he's gone. Now, 20 wins and, and barely getting to the tournament, that isn't a good season anymore. Whereas in 1984, that would have been a miracle. We used to sit around talking in the round table in his office about, you know, what would happen at Vegas after Tarkania or at Georgetown after Thompson, because those were, those schools were the personality of that coach. And now it's come full circle because I think Jim Calhoun means Connecticut basketball. All the coaches in between were just like stewards or shepherds waiting for JC to come. And the man came and he did take us to the promised land. What he did in retrospect is, I'd call it a miracle. This is an NBC 30 special presentation. Jim Calhoun, the road to the Hall of Fame. Hi everybody and welcome to Jim Calhoun, the road to the Hall of Fame. I'm Kevin Nathan along with Persephone Contos. Tomorrow night, UConn basketball coach Jim Calhoun will be enshrined into the Basketball Hall of Fame here in Springfield, Massachusetts, alongside these other faces. Tonight, we take a look at how he got here. Wherever there are Hall of Famers, people who have distinguished themselves in their career, I belong with them. And that's a club that, that certainly you'd love to be able to join. But how did he get there? We'll look back at the life of Jim Calhoun from his humble beginnings in Braintree to his career at Northeastern and UConn to his bout with cancer. It was uh, very scary. And we'll go beyond the bench with the coach and find out what he's like at home. To me, he's, you know, my husband, the love of my life, the father of my children, you know, grand, papa to all our grandchildren. Plus, we'll find out which players, which team, and which game stand out from the rest. It meant so much to a state. It meant so much to so many people. But first, we explore the remarkable career of Coach Calhoun. A career per se that took Jim Calhoun from Northeastern to UConn and UConn from a regional team to a national powerhouse. Come on, come on! It's a game uh, almost unlike any other. Go get him! It allows you with a ball to dream. And then by working hard, and having the help of others to make it come true. A spot on the Basketball Hall of Fame is a dream come true for Jim Calhoun. But for a man who first made a name for himself as a player in college at AIC, just a few hundred jump shots away from the Hall of Fame, it's hard to fathom basketball immortality. Beyond my wildest dreams, because I never really dreamed about being in the Hall of Fame, I just dreamed about hopefully someday have people say this guy can really coach and he really helped kids. First, he had to learn how to help himself. When Calhoun was only 15, his father died of a heart attack. It forced Calhoun to become a leader to his brother and four sisters. The death of my dad altered the way I had to look at life. I just felt that now the burden of responsibility was placed upon me. Clearly was a father figure to me in those early years. 
Calhoun took those leadership qualities into coaching, first at the high school level, and then as a 28-year-old head coach at Northeastern. At first I thought, man, I'm gonna have a job sort of taming this guy down a little bit. Uh, you know, he's a little bit over the top, a little out of control. I never tamed him. And we all just got used to him. And all got to love him, too. After leading Northeastern to the NCAA tournament in five of his final six years, UConn hired him. It was May 15th, 1986, the day UConn basketball changed forever. It's just that I feel UConn has got the pieces. It now has to be put together with time and an awful lot of hard work. Uh, once again, to head in the right direction. The pieces are here. There was no doubt in his mind that he could get it done here now. He's coming to a place that had four straight losing seasons and really had just come out of talk where maybe they should get out of the Big East. Not only did UConn stay in the Big East, they eventually ruled it. UConn, in an amazing turnaround, captures the Big East tournament. Let the celebration begin. In Calhoun's second season, the Huskies won the NIT. By his fourth year, UConn captured its first Big East title. And in 1999, the Huskies reached the promised land. UConn is the national champion. The Huskies have climbed to the top of the NCAA mountain. When Calhoun started at UConn, a national championship was unthinkable. When uh, Jim came, you were hopeful to be one of the top four in New England. And now we're uh, not going to be happy unless we're top four in the, in the nation. Calhoun's formula for success starts with people, passion, and persistence. I think those qualities, being at the right place, having the right players, and then letting no one give more than you give. White ball above, lazy pass, easy pass. When some guys show up thinking they're early and it's 6 a.m., he's already been there at five, because that's just how he is. I've often thought that when he, Jimmy was 13, 14, or 15, he never lost a fight because he always threw first. He eats and sleeps basketball year round especially. You know, he's like a different person during the season because he wants to win so bad. Come on, Marcus, don't pull the strings. There's always that threshold of pain where you want to stop. And coach was the type that wouldn't let you feel that. It's tough to think of a six foot five inch guy as a jockey, but he, he knows how to ride his teams. Blue ball above, you start working people. The trademark of Calhoun coach teams, defense and lots of running. Here's Rudy, all the way to tie it with the tomahawk. But the coach never runs away from his players' needs. A lot of head coaches don't travel with their teams. They go by themselves. Jim is always with the kids. Keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. And I'm a hands-on guy. I'm not one of those guys that don't show up and shoot around. Some coaches do that. And I want to be there with my kids. I want to actually, a lot of times, live the experience of being a player through them. And I find out that, that creates the bond that a lot of my players have with me and I have with them. That bond took on special meaning in February of 2003, when Jim Calhoun was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I want to get it out of my system, and I want to uh, fight this like I've fought everything else in my life, and uh, I'll win this battle. And... Calhoun missed three weeks of coaching that season, but he beat cancer, and a year later beat the odds again, leading UConn to a second national title much like a championship team, cancer left a lasting impression on the coach. It was uh, very scary because I, 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 I want a team. I want to coach a team. I want to be involved with the team. I want to hopefully make some kind of difference in, in young people's lives. And that's very, very important to me. And so prostate cancer gave me a reaffirmation of what I was doing to some of our kids, particularly. It, it, has, uh, it has some importance in their lives. And, and there's nothing more that you can do is, is to be able to impact others. But Calhoun's impact on the game of basketball still hasn't quite set in. How can I wear those? <laughs> his Hall of Fame status is now written on t-shirts and on the smiles of his wife and family. One of Calhoun's sisters proudly displays a Webster Bank cutout of her famous brother. She finally got one, and she's gonna have it in her house with Hall of Famer across. I said, Rose, you can't do that. It just, it's just awful, but it isn't awful. It's the way she feels about her brother. It's a pride that she shows in him, which in turn is a tremendous sense to me that someone who I love very much, my older sister as well as my other sisters and brother, uh, that they get so much out of it and that, that makes it incredibly worthwhile. 
Calhoun will share his Hall of Fame night with 170 friends, family, players, and coaches. And after he's introduced by Celtics legend Bob Cousy, Calhoun may share a side of himself we rarely see during a game. He's not the guy you see yelling on the floor trying to get his truth and he's clapping like that. He's almost the exact opposite of what he is on the court. You know, it's, it's tough to... It's tough to get him angry. But he made a comment. He said, you know, people, the fans think when I go home, I look at Pat and I start cursing at her and telling her to pass the bleep, bleep, bleep and pillow and this and that. Now you see him doing things and ranting and raving that, like, wow, this guy's a little rough around the edges. But 22 other hours, you know, he's, he's a human being and he's a family man. And now Jim Calhoun, a father figure to so many, joins the founding father of basketball at the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. And I guess I could say incredibly proudly that wherever there are Hall of Famers, people who have distinguished themselves in their career, I belong with them. And that's something that, that's a club that, that certainly you'd love to be join. Coach Calhoun certainly deserves a place among basketball's immortals. Since the NCAA tournament expanded to 64 teams in 1985, he and Duke's Mike Krzyzewski are the only coaches to win more than one national championship. Calhoun's led the Huskies to a record nine Big East regular season titles and six Big East tournament championships. In 33 seasons as a head coach, he's won more than 700 games, the most of any coach in New England history. And the four-time Big East Coach of the Year has led UConn to 18 straight postseason tournaments, 13 NCAAs, and the NIT five times. The other members of the 2005 Hall of Fame class are coach and broadcaster Hubie Brown, women's coach Sue Gunter, Hortensia Marcari, and Syracuse coach Jim Beheim. And going into the Hall of Fame with his longtime rival and friend Jim Beheim makes tomorrow night's ceremony all the more special for Coach Calhoun. I always liked Jimmy, but I really developed an incredible respect for the, the, his ability to continue to be good, continue to win, continue to get good players and continue to handle it the exact same way regardless of outcome. There's just so much respect between Jim Calhoun and Jim Beheim. In fact, Coach Beheim calls what Jim Calhoun's done at UConn the greatest building job in the history of college basketball. But behind every successful man is a good woman. Amid all of Coach Calhoun's success, he's always remained most loyal to his family. He's real. What you see is the Jim Calhoun that he is. When we return, we'll show you a side of the coach you've never seen on the bench. Welcome back to Jim Calhoun, The Road to the Hall of Fame. I'm Kevin Nathan along with Persephone Contest. And Persephone, so much has changed for Jim Calhoun since he was a college student here in Springfield at AIC all the way back in the 1960s. That's right, Kev. He's now a two-time national champion, one of the highest paid coaches in the country, and a basketball Hall of Famer. But to those who know him best, he's still just a hardworking guy from Braintree, Massachusetts, who always puts his family first. My dad was my best friend, he was my hero, he was this person that I worshipped. So the loss of him was just a hole um, that I've been able to fill with, with my family, with, with my family now. Um, but it, it took a long time for that to happen. Jim Calhoun lost his father when he was 15 and a half. That tragic loss would obviously play a large role in molding him into the man he would grow to be. My biggest goal in life was never to disappoint him. I never wanted to disappoint him in anything. I never went to the funeral. I just couldn't take it. I wanted to remember my dad sitting there saying, look, you got a game today. Just play as high as you can, and I'll be out in center field. I'll be proud as heck of you. I never saw him again. Um, I went to the game, and he went to the, uh, the hospital. He was on the field playing, and they came and got him. Some neighbor, you probably know that story, called to him over the fence and says, Jim, you better go home. Your father died, and that's how he heard it. And he went home and his mother was there and he went over to his mother and said, don't worry, mom, I'll take care of you. At 15 and a half, that's pretty good. Jim Calhoun did take care of them. He says it's sometimes a burden, this sense of responsibility, but adds he doesn't see it as a curse. I bring that sense of responsibility um, probably to extremes and, and you can't check it at the door. It's not like hanging up a jacket 
it stays with you. And, uh, I have that and I know I have that and I've identified it and I think it came from the fact that I thought I was responsible. I was going to take care of my mom and my sisters and my, my young brother and I think that's obviously one of the greatest gifts I have because I won't give in until it's done but it's also something that once again stays with you sometimes when maybe you should just relax, go away. But that's not like him, the man who was born and raised in a blue collar neighborhood in Braintree, Massachusetts. It was a tight knit community back then and many in the town looked after young Jim Calhoun after his father's death. People watched out for me. They made sure that I got myself together, uh, was able to get my life going, and, uh, and, and, and put me in the right direction. Years later, his sister Margaret introduced him to a girl from Weymouth named Pat. They married in 1967 and have two sons, two daughters-in-law, and six grandchildren. Oh, I describe him as um, handsome first. I just describe him as caring, just this wonderful, truthful, moral, loving person who is never afraid to show his emotions and, and that he's real. What you see is the Jim Calhoun that he is. That's the one thing I think I've always been proud of him about. It's very hard sometimes to be in this kind of a profession where their um, things aren't always as they appear to be and he is who he is and, um, and I love that about him. I just don't see him as a basketball coach. To me he's, you know, my husband, love of my life, the father of my children, papa to all our grandchildren. I see the man who doesn't turn off the lights, who, you know, <laughs> does the things that annoy every wife too. Um, I see him for who he is and he's an enormously caring, supportive person and he brings that to his job certainly as well. His players, his coaching staff, they are all members of Jim Calhoun's extended family. Former player Karan Butler makes a special phone call to Coach Calhoun once every year. Every Father's Day, uh, Karan calls me and says, Happy Father's Day. It's C, Coach, because you are my father. That's very meaningful to me. I give him a hug every time I see him. I call him Pops, you know, because that's what he is to me, a father. I grew up without a father, and he's the closest thing to one that I ever had in my life. So, you know, we real, we got a great relationship. I talk to him every other day, even though I'm gone, I'm still in touch with him. People have told Jim Calhoun he's mellowed out. His answer, you're just looking harder at the man. But being a grandfather has brought out something in him. I think it's brought out uh, something I probably had now uh, 25 years ago when I had my sons who were younger and I would drive Pat crazy with uh, giving them soda, coffee, gum, ice cream. And every time they complained now as parents, you know, what are you doing, Dad? You, you, you're ruining the kids. I said, you guys had it. You turned out all right. It is a cycle of life and when I'm with them, it, it really tells me that there is a plan that, that it, it keeps on going and, and they're Calhouns and they're growing up and they really, really are a, a wonder in both Pat and my, my lives. I think it brings out a side in you that, that, that you're glad you still have. It's great. It's like, uh, you know, having all, of, all the fun and, 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 and with less responsibility. But you still worry about them. We just hope that, 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 that uh, you know, that, that everything turns out in their lives the way, quite frankly, that turned out in Pat and, and my lives. Pat has been with him every step of the way. Tomorrow, she joins her husband by his side for the honor of a lifetime. I've watched Jim achieve a dream that in reality you really don't dream of because it's not something that you can say, that you can't aspire to be in the Hall of Fame when you're starting out a career. So I think it, for me, it's just been a journey that I've walked you know, side by side with Jim and get to see him um, just you know, achieve the pinnacle of success for him. He leaves with his players, I think the same thing he leaves with his children and will leave with his grandchildren. And I think that that's probably the nicest compliment I could pay him is that I would be so proud of our sons if they grew up to be exactly like their dad and our grandson and even granddaughters. Um, I hope they get the very best of Jim Calhoun. And Jim Calhoun also cares deeply about his extended family, the players and assistant coaches he's gone to battle with over the last four decades. When we return, Coach Calhoun reflects on some of those players, teams, and games that stand out the most in his Hall of Fame career. Greatest game you've ever been involved in. That's really hard.
Welcome back to Jim Calhoun, the road to the Hall of Fame. Our tribute to the longtime UConn coach who will be enshrined into the Basketball Hall of Fame here in Springfield tomorrow night. Now, Persef, to ask a Hall of Fame coach with more than 700 wins and a room full of trophies to pinpoint a couple of moments in an incredible career is almost impossible, but we tried it anyway. Greatest game you've ever been involved in? It would probably be the Duke 99 championship game. It's one of the best played games in the history of the NCAA Final Four. It meant so much to a state. It meant so much to so many people. And it put us squarely on the map that we are now 101% a player. And Calhoun gave his players complete confidence they could pull the upset. I would have been shocked if we hadn't. And I, I told my assistants that, and they all kind of looked at me kind of funny. You know, this is supposed to be a Duke team for the ages. And it was a great team, by the way. But we were more experienced. And I knew that the, 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 the team bought everything I was selling. The result, a 77 to 74 win. But he'd rather forget this. Calhoun calls the loss to Christian Leitner and Duke in the final eight in 1990 his hardest defeat ever. Particularly because of the way they hit that team. That team was magical. The 1990 dream season, there'll never be another one like it. That loss was a very, very difficult one. And what must have made it even tougher was the way you won two days earlier. Turns around, shoots, and he got it! He did it! It almost seemed that, that the F8 was going to take us someplace very special, and this team deserved it because we played so well during the season. You won't pick a best player of all time, though, will you? Never. No, I don't think that there is. I think that unto itself, each player has contributed so much to what we've been and what we like. I mean, uh, we'll get a player tomorrow, next day, next week, next month because of Ray Allen. We'll get another player because of Rebecca. They're still contributing. But the player that was most prepared on and off the court would be Emeka Okafor? There is no question in my mind. I mean, but you know what? I would imagine people in finance would tell you the same thing. Everything about him, he was the most, you know, a purpose-driven life, I think, is, is Warren's book now. That's a Mac Okafor. Well, those are definitely some Hall of Fame moments, but Persef, what makes a Hall of Fame coach? Coming up, a tribute to Jim Calhoun from past players, coaches, friends, family, and colleagues. I give him a hug every time I see him. I call him Pops, you know, because that's what he is to me, a father. You're watching an NBC 30 special presentation, Jim Calhoun, The Road to the Hall of Fame. It's been an amazing journey for Jim Calhoun, from losing his father when he was 15 to winning two national championships at UConn. Yet, as his longtime friend and former UConn Sports Information Director Tim Tollican once told me, Jim Calhoun really won't be fully appreciated for stuff until long after he's gone. But his career will always be appreciated and remembered here in Springfield, where tomorrow night he becomes a Hall of Famer. Absolutely, Persef. Thank you for watching Jim Calhoun, The Road to the Hall of Fame. For Persephone Contos, I'm Kevin Nathan. We we'll leave you tonight with some of the qualities that have made Jim Calhoun a coaching legend. If you know him or you, or you ever was coached by him, whenever you see him, you just want to give him a big hug. Um, he respects each and every player, and I think uh, you have to in turn respect him. He goes out of his way, you know, to to make people feel special. A lot of people who don't know Coach don't know how nice a person he is and how helpful he is to others. Love him to death. He was like a second father to me. He's a good person to be around. You know, you know, it's fun to be around people that are passionate about life. Demands a lot from everybody around, but also gives everything he can on the court and off the court. He's competitive. He wants nothing but the best. And he gets the most out of you. He's such an intense guy. He's such a guy that you know, he's so passionate towards his, his work. He really wants people to leave there knowing that they have a place they can come back to anytime. If you could narrow it down to one person, if you could uh, choose somebody that would be the center of the program, you wouldn't hesitate and you wouldn't think twice that's Coach Calhoun. For what he's achieved in, in coaching college basketball, I don't think anybody else can do that. All great companies and all great organizations have great CEOs and leaders, and you know, that's why UConn basketball has been so good since he's been there. All the coaches in between were just like stewards or shepherds waiting for J.C. to come. And the man came and he t did take us to the promised land. What he did in retrospect is, I'd call it a miracle. If I had to do it all over again, say I can snap my fingers and go back to being 18 years old again, I, I would come back to UConn and, and play for coach in a second. Connecticut basketball is Jim Calhoun.
This is an NBC 30 special presentation. Kino Oriyama, the road to the Hall of Fame. Hi, and welcome to Gino Oriyama, the road to the Hall of Fame. I'm Kevin Nathan here at the Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield. And I'm Persephone Contos. Now, if this all seems familiar, yes, we've been here before. As it was just last year that UConn men's basketball coach Jim Calhoun was enshrined into the Hall of Fame as well. Tomorrow night, it's Gino Oriyama's turn. Tonight, we take a look at how we got here. I just stop and I'll look around and I'll go, man. I can't believe we did that. UConn is the national champion. From Italian immigrant to a street smart kid in Philly to the Basketball Hall of Fame, we'll take you through Gino Ariema's journey to immortality and show you how he transformed UConn women's basketball into a dynasty. Connecticut is the basketball capital of the country. Not very many people get to create something out of nothing. You know, so we took something that didn't exist and we made it important. But first, the honor of a lifetime for Gino Oriema. It's a lot to take in for a man who came to the United States from Italy as a young boy and who tomorrow will be permanently honored here in Springfield, Massachusetts. I don't want people to get carried away by it, though. You know, you don't want to walk in and, you know, here comes the Hall of Famer. I mean. In a post-game interview, I shouldn't address you. So. No, 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 no. Gino Oriyama describes his induction into the Basketball Hall of Fame as a great thing. But ask him to elaborate, and he's stuck. It, it's really hard to put, like in a small little package, what it is for me. It, it, I can't find the, the right words. So here he is, honored for his contributions to coaching, a career choice which his parents, particularly his dad, didn't understand. I remember he was wondering how I was going to pay for my house. And he could never quite figure out why I didn't work for a living. You know, you're a basketball coach. Like, who does that? My mother had a little better grasp of it. If you asked her right now, like, she goes, oh, it's nice. Everybody likes my son. You know, it's a great thing. And I'm so proud of him. And he's, the, you know, the nicest boy, you know. And it would say, well, do you know who's in the Hall of Fame? No, I know, no, no, no. It's, I like Shaq. <laughs> I guess she'll tell you that. She goes, I love her, the Shaq. He's my favorite. If you ask about anybody else, you don't know anybody. There are a lot of uh, factors, obviously, that, will, that played into the program's success and the program's growth, but what were the key defining moments for you? Winning the national championship in 1995. UConn has won the national championship! The way we did it, how it happened, the personalities involved. Once it got to that point, I knew there was no turning back. After we beat Tennessee at home in January, I said, this is, this is beyond anything anybody could have ever imagined. What's it feel like for you, knowing what you've brought to this program? I mean, do you get overwhelmed by that? It hits me sometimes when I'm walking through Gamble when there's no one around. Sometimes I'll just stop and I'll look around and I'll go, man, I can't believe we did that. And then you think about when I got the job and what basketball was and what the university itself was. To see it now, it's comparing different centuries. Who is the most challenging player you've ever coached? All the great ones were tremendous challenges in their own right. Each one different, and each one more enjoyable than the one before it. Baseline to Lobo. Goes Rebecca, the because in. of the expectations that she brought that were imposed on her by others. Jennifer, because of her stubbornness, was a huge challenge. Svetlana had a lot of Jen in her, you know. All the great ones were really stubborn. Nikisha, because she was so laid back, so that was a, a challenge to get her intensity level. Classic Diana Taurasi. Diana, because she was Diana, and she thought she was Jerry West, Michael Jordan, and Madonna all rolled into one, you know? And like, how are you gonna deal with that? What do you want your legacy to be at UConn? I would like to have people think back to what we've done, how we've done it, and be the model that it's compared to from here on in. As long as we're always thought of in those terms, then I'll be happy. What about your legacy to, to women's basketball and how you make the help the sport grow? What do you want just general fans to remember? Not very many people get to create something out of nothing. You know, so we took something that didn't exist and we made it important. I think you just do something you love and try to be really good at it, and then you wake up one morning and go, how did this happen? but it just kind of happens 
if you pay attention every day to being really good at it. Tarazi a three. Good. We put something into the fabric of Connecticut that didn't exist. And in that respect, we're pioneers in a lot of ways. Whenever they talk about the history of women's basketball, they're gonna bring up Connecticut women's basketball. In 21 seasons at UConn, Oriyama has led the Huskies to five national championships, including three straight from 2002 to 2004, eight Final Four appearances, and two undefeated seasons. Oriyama's Huskies have won 14 regular season Big East titles and 13 Big East tournament championships. And just last year, Oriyama was inducted into the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. The other members of the class of 2006 are Joe Dumars, Dominique Wilkins, Charles Barkley, David Gavitt, and Sandro Gamba. Now, when we come back, we'll take you back to stores. Not the place we know as the basketball capital of the world, but the program that was nowhere on the map. That's when Gino Oriema, the road to the Hall of Fame, continues. NFL kickoff 2006 on NBC 30. Before the Miami Pittsburgh opening, tune in for our NFL preview with interviews and analysis on Connecticut Pacers impacting the NFL. The NFL kickoff 2006 show, tonight at 7.30, only on NBC 30. Come home, come on home to Big Y, to Big Y. Come home, come on home, come home to Big Y. Come on home. Taste the freshness and quality. We do it all for you. So come home to your world class. Name on the market, Big Y. Keep having these amazing dreams. My foot hovered before it hit the ground. I think I can fly. Heroes, coming to NBC Mondays. Dude, last night I had a dream we went to Friendly's. We are at Friendly's. Weird. What did we order? You had honey barbecue chicken, he had buffalo chicken. Your dream sounds delicious. Satisfy your cravings with our honey barbecue chicken strips platter, new grilled buffalo chicken platter, or spice it up with our new firecracker barbecue chicken strips platter. All come with a free happy ending Sunday. Was she in your dream? No, but he was. So come on, get in, get friendly. Make sure not to miss Raymore and Flanagan's two-day sale, where you'll find incredible savings on bedrooms, living rooms, dining rooms, and recliners. Prices are marked down in every department. Buy now with no money down and interest-free financing all the way till 2009. Get your dream furniture sooner than you expected. Delivered in three days or less, guaranteed. For great savings you won't want to miss, shop Raymore and Flanagan's two-day sale. Two-day sale. It's weather, plus... There's a developing situation we're tracking for you right now. It's weather, plus... It'll be smooth sailing this weekend for travelers. Bob Maxson every morning. It's 5-11. Time for your weather plus on the 1. Brad Peel every night. Let's check out the neighborhood network temperatures. Weather, anytime you want it, any way you want it. Online, on digital cable, on NBC 30. You can't control the weather, but it doesn't have to control you. NBC 30, weather, plus... Welcome back to Gino Oriema, the road to the Hall of Fame. I'm Persephone Contos alongside Kevin Nathan. And you know, Kev, Coach Oriema jokes that he loves to hear about the vision he had when he accepted the job in stores. Oh, yeah, that vision. Actually, he says there was no vision. There wasn't much else in stores 21 years ago. Certainly not a great women's basketball team. But through the sheer force of his personality and a little luck, Gino Oriema turned UConn Women's Hoops into one of the best programs in America. He's always had that belief. He's always been a confident guy. People think it's cocky. I, you know, it's not that. He's just a confident guy. He believes in what he does. You know, I think most times, us as his players, we, we took on his personality. And that, that confidence, that cockiness, and, and you need that. You know, you need that in order to win. He can relate to anyone. He has the knack of getting people to do what he wants them to do. He doesn't want to be patting them on the back and say, nice try, after something goes wrong. He wants to bring out the best in them, and they want the best brought out of them. And he'll do that. He's real tough. He knows what buttons to push with Sue Bird. They're not the same buttons you push with Diana Tarazi, but he gets the same kind of results out of the two of them. Tarazi heaves. 
If you had only had the opportunity to see him, you know, coaching, you would think he's a total jerk, you know, that with him out there yelling at the players. Sometimes I think he charms them into being great teams, and sometimes I think he, uh, he screams out and being great teams. And the results speak even louder. In his 21 seasons at UConn, Gino Auriemma's teams have won five national championships. He turned a fledgling program into one of the most successful teams in the country. There was a lot of guys when he took that job that were really down what he was doing. I was there the first summer that he got the job. I was there when they were working in a closet. Everything about the place just reeked of average or below average and everything. When Oriema took the UConn job in 1985, nothing was in place for success. Mediocre facilities, mediocre attitude, and no winning tradition. In some ways, the worst job in the market that you could take because it's all built in for you to lose. They've never won. These guys want to be in the Big East and trying to compete against teams at the national level with this. That's not going to work. A lot of things fell into place early. In 1989, they won their first Big East championship. Courageous in many ways. Gino is a very courageous person. He just was limited by the environment and by a field house. Then in 1990, Gamble Pavilion arrived and UConn basketball physically moved into the big time. The men had their dream season and just the state went basketball crazy. Everybody wanted to see games at Gamble, but they couldn't get tickets for it. The women's games were drawing few fans. They had tickets available for those games. The building itself was an attraction. People came because they wanted to see the building, and there happened to be a very good product on the court at the time. People liked it, and so they came back. People must have thought like a spaceship landed when it opened. People were just storming in here for the Georgetown game. They're like 2,500 people all standing on the concourse. What the hell's going on here? The women are playing. We got a women's team here? In 1991, UConn goes to the Final Four. The next year, Rebecca Lobo is on campus. So a lot of things fell into place for them that made this all happen. We recruited a couple kids that were a lot better than other people thought they were and came in here and got even better and better. And we got lucky. He had just squeezed blood from a turnip to get those kids at that level of performing, you know, probably surprised himself, too. Yeah, the intramural team in 1985, 86, and we're in the Final Four in 1991. At that point in time, he began to realize this guy's got what it takes, and he's really been a contender ever since. He was able to get a group of kids from, from the New England area for the first really good team that went to the Final Four. And what happened was, which, which Connecticut was smart, they built upon that success. Oriema made mediocre players respectable, good players great, and great players legends. UConn has won the national championship. What he gets out of his players, I don't think anyone else gets that from their players. No one in the country. We've had players that have very little talent, myself included, that he's found a way to get you know, and, and tap into some talent that you never thought you would have. You can tell by the way his teams play that he generally wants to pay homage to the game of basketball. It's like watching the 1958 Celtics. It's team basketball below the rim. People always say, well, he has all the talent. Well, that's true. He does have a lot of talent. But a lot of people can't get those talented players to play as a unit. He loves and lives for practice. He's going to put you in tough situations every day in practice so that come game time, it's going to be a piece of cake. He loves basketball. He's nothing more than a glorified gym rat. Everything about him on the court is intense, you know, down to the little vein that sticks out in his cheek when he's yelling at you. He spits on you, and you have to sort of wipe it off and just act like you're still listening to him when you want to laugh at him for completely losing his mind. Gloria is just as authentic during recruiting. He's able to charm even dads. He can even get under the dad skin a little bit. Well, I think the players who need to be pampered and need to have their ego stroke um, don't come to Connecticut. He's recruiting one of the top guards in the country, and talks to her on the phone, and he can't stand the kid, and she's a brat, she's a punk, whatever she may be. He'll stop recruiting her, regardless of her basketball ability. The whole recruiting process, you just really felt comfortable, and you felt that that's somebody I could play for, that's somebody who could motivate me. But how can a middle-aged man from Philadelphia relate so well to 18, 19, and 20-year-old women? If you think about all the women he's around, all the time for the last nearly 20 years just here, he's a chick. I don't make any differentiation between their guys and these are girls. None. 
Zero. He, he never says females. He never says girls, young ladies. He, he looks at everyone as a basketball player. So could Gino Auriemma coach guys? Could I? Yeah, my approach would be exactly the same. And his approach towards star players, exactly the same, if not tougher. Fortunately, uh, I only hated him for two years. There were parts of my freshman and sophomore year where I didn't get him. I would call home a lot and complain to my parents about the way coach was yelling at me, and I didn't understand it. So Rebecca Lobo's parents suggested she talk to the coach. He pulled out a media guide and um, turned to my page, and right there it said what my goals were, and it said I wanted to be uh, play for the Olympics. And he said to me, is this still your goal? Do you still want to be an Olympian? I said, yeah. He said, well, it's my job to make you an Olympian. And right now, uh, I need to teach you how to work hard. Most players eventually come to understand and admire Rory Emma's tough love. He has that great balance where he can get all over you, but at the same time, while he's you know, yelling and cursing in practice, he says something that's just so darn funny that it breaks up the tension. You always stink when you play for him, and then once you graduate, you're the greatest player ever. When we come back, Gino Oriema's journey from immigrant to the Basketball Hall of Fame here in Springfield. You're watching Gino Oriema, The Road to the Hall of Fame. It's a new day today. Tell me what's been going on. Wanna take every morning and just make it last, make it last, make it last. It's a new day. dreamt you could fly, experiencing that incredible feeling of freedom as you float slowly, effortlessly through the air, you might say that's what the perfect mattress feels like, joyful, peaceful, totally comfortable, and capable of making you feel wonderful each and every night. And thanks to Sleepy's The Mattress Professionals, we can make your dreams come true, at least the ones about finding the perfect mattress at an unbeatable price. It's an Ellen exclusive with Andre Agassi when Ellen's biggest premiere week continues. In his first television interview since his emotional retirement, Andre Agassi sits down with Ellen for a look back at his extraordinary 21-year career and a look ahead at what's next. Then, Oscar winner Kim Basinger. And Monday, you've heard all the gossip. Now, what Jessica Simpson has to say about Nick, her sister, and who is she in love with? Next, Ellen. Tomorrow at 4, here on NBC 30. The world's largest retailer of hot tubs is having a factory liquidation sale. For two days only, choose from over 100 Thermospa hot tubs. New units slightly scratched up to 60% off. Trade-ins as low as $5.99. Chemicals and accessories up to 70% off. And see our new revolutionary swim spa on sale. Thermospa's liquidation sale is this Saturday and Sunday from 10 to 6 at the Mass Mutual Center in Springfield, Mass. For directions, visit thermospasale.com. Come down to the NBC 30 Connecticut Women's Expo September 9th and 10th at the Connecticut Expo Center. Meet Lauren Coslow and Austin Peck from Days of Our Lives. Plus, enjoy hundreds of exhibits and live demonstrations. Proudly sponsored by Trantolo and Trantolo, Goodwin College, and the Department of Homeland Security. My car! Kevin! Welcome back to Gino Oriema, the road to the Hall of Fame. Now, Gino's journey to basketball immortality began in a place where soccer rules. Yeah, Persef, as a kid, Gino Oriema had to learn a lot more than basketball. He had to learn a new language, a new culture, and a new way of life. He's Luigi from outside of Naples, before he became Gino from inside Norristown. He was baptized Luigino Oriema in Montella, Italy. But in 1961, when he was seven, Oriema's family moved to Norristown, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. The oldest of three children spoke only Italian and played only soccer. When we first come over here, I know I had no problem for school, no problem with sport. Really, I never had a problem. He picked it up real fast. He was more quiet, reserved, but he was more of a person who, like, watched people, watched situations, and not really very outspoken unless he had to be. Hard to imagine, 
but in the Oriema's first house, the family lived with Chino's aunt, uncle, four cousins, and very little else. They didn't have credit cards. I do remember that my clothes were all different because uh, the clothes that I was wearing were clothes that my mother made me. His mom uh, in Norsan used to walk to work to walk in the car carpet factory. His dad never drove. I don't think it was until he was 56. I remember walking like a couple miles to work every day. He made bricks uh, in a factory. So he got paid for the amount of bricks that he could actually stack in a day. The deck was stacked against Oriema. His parents worked long hours and spoke little English. Because of the language barrier with my parents, it forced us all to be responsible. It was kind of like a blessing and a curse that my parents were never involved in what I was doing. He did the banking and he did the bartering with the merchants. It's how you had to be. I mean, it's the way you grew up. He has always been the leader in the family. He was a good boy. Sports helped keep Gino on the right side of the track. He'd walk down this train track in Norristown to a nearby baseball field and play his first love after school, baseball. And I loved every minute of it. I mean, I could play baseball every single day. We couldn't speak English when we came over here. Thank God we were pretty good athletes in the fact that we could play sports, you know? So that, that, that made it a little easier. It just became the way I became associated with everybody around me, and, and that became my connection to, like, being in America. He was a good athlete. Uh, baseball, basketball, uh, a lot of tennis. We played a lot of tennis growing up. I liked the people a lot more that I met on the tennis court than I did on the basketball court. But that changed. Cut from his ninth grade basketball team, Oriema eventually made the varsity, starting at point guard at Bishop Kenrick for Bud Gardler, a coach he still emulates. Anybody who tried to be like a big timer or anybody who tried to be like draw too much attention to themselves, those guys were looked at like, we don't need these guys. The type of kid Gino was, I'd take 10 like that now. They just want to play, no, no crap, no bull, let's just go play. And coach. While still taking classes in college at Westchester, Oriema landed an assistant job coaching high school girls. And I said, you got to be kidding me. Who wants to coach girls? First of all, they can't play, number one. Number two, if any of my friends find out I'm coaching girls basketball, they're going to think I've like, lost my mind completely. After two seasons coaching high school and one year at St. Joseph's University under Jim Foster, Oriema returned to his old high school coaching boys under future Division I men's coach Bill Martelli. So I'm thinking, man, what could be better than this? Like dying and going ahead. That's when I kind of thought, you know what, this is what I'm going to do. But he stocked shelves and drove a truck to make ends meet. You name it, I did it just so that I could still go to school once in a while and still coach. But that told me that you could get a real job. Two years later, thanks to Martelli, Oriema got as real a coaching job as you can get. Virginia's looking for a full-time assistant, but but I said, no way, Phil. I'm not doing it. So I've had enough of that girls' basketball stuff. He said, well, what do you got to lose? Go down and look at it. After one look at UVA's campus and commitment, Gino was sold. His recruiting prowess led them to a Final Four. Four years later, UConn offered him a job. When we come back, a final tribute to ingoing Hall of Famer Gino Oriema. This is Gino Oriema, the road to the Hall of Fame. NBC, we're back in football. Let's go! go, go. The NFL season kicks off on NBC tonight when the Super Bowl champion Steelers take on the Dolphins. The champs are back. With music by Rascal Flatts and Diddy. Then Sunday, the premiere of Sunday Night Football on NBC as the Colts take on the Giants, where for the first time ever, it's Manning versus Manning. Doesn't get any better than this. Kickoff weekend starts tonight on NBC. NBC30.com. More video than ever before. Top stories. Sports, entertainment, the download. We're reinventing news online. The alert bar. Or instant breaking news. Webcasts. Sent to your personal preferences. Sent to your wireless device. Podcasts. Right to your iPod. Weather Plus. Forecasts tailored to your zip code. Accurate, live, and always on. Setting our site to a higher standard. NBC30.com, Connecticut's online news leader. Sesame Street Live's Elmo Makes Music is coming to the Hartford Civic Center, and NBC30 is giving away tickets. Winners will receive a family four-pack to the show, and the grand prize winner gets four tickets plus a $500 gift certificate to Joey's. Register at any Connecticut Joey's location. Good morning. Good morning, Persephone. Let's scrap. Thanks, 
Tá? Tchau, tchau. Awesome TV. Where'd you get it? Bernie's. They delivered it, set it up. Whole nine yards. Wow. They do it all. Chips. Um. Service, selection, savings. Bernie's brings it home. Service, selection, savings. Bernie's brings it home. It's our largest flat screen event of the year. Get LG's 42-inch plasma for only $15.99. And no down payment, no payments, and no interest for 24 months on any LG TV. Bernie's brings it home. Sesame Street Live's Elmo Makes Music is coming to the Hartford Civic Center. And NBC30 is giving away tickets. Winners will receive a family four-pack to the show. And the grand prize winner gets four tickets plus a $500 gift certificate to Joey's. Register at any Connecticut Joey's location. You're watching an NBC30 special presentation. Gino Oriema, The Road to the Hall of Fame. Tomorrow, it becomes official. Gino Oriema will be enshrined into the Basketball Hall of Fame here in Springfield, Massachusetts. We leave you tonight with some of the people who know Gino Oriema best. For Persephone Contos, I'm Kevin Nathan. Stick around. Our NFL kickoff special is next. Anyone who plays for him has a respect and a genuine love for him and they, they want him in their life forever. There's just an aura about him, like I said. Um, it really makes you want to be around him. A very giving person, I mean, and he treats everyone the same. He had, you know, such a, a bond with the players. I'm just proud of what he's done just for women's basketball and um, just for women's sports in general. Not only will he be the best coach that ever coached the game, but he'll, he will have impacted hundreds of women's lives. You could always go to coach, and that's one thing I always respected about him. He does it in his way, and, and that hasn't changed. He did it the right way. He brought a whole state along with, with him. Look what you can do with something that people thought could never happen. His legacy will be what it already is, and that's that he's the best coach um, to ever coach women's basketball. It's weather. Plus. There's a developing situation we're tracking for you right now. It's weather. Plus. It'll be smooth sailing this weekend for travelers. Bob Maxson every morning. It's 5-11. Time for your weather plus on the one. Brad Field every night. Let's check out the neighborhood network temperatures. Weather. Anytime you want it. Any way you want it. Online. On digital cable on NBC 30. You can't control the weather, but it doesn't have to control you. NBC 30. Weather. He was known as the terror of Fiddlefield. He had more interceptions in a season than any player in school history. He carried the fabled Red Devils to their first undefeated season in 52 years. He was the most feared defensive player that was under six foot and weighed less than 200 pounds and played Division Three ball in history. Now, Kevin Nathan is ready for the National Football League. The NFL is back on NBC 30. We're ready. Are you? This is an NBC 30 special presentation, NFL Kickoff 2006. Hey, everybody. Welcome to NFL Kickoff 2006. I'm Kevin Nathan, along with Persephone Contos, live here in our studio as we get set for the return of NFL football to NBC. That's right, Kev. Tonight, it's the season opener with the Dolphins taking on the world champion Steelers. And tonight, we'll get you ready for football with a look at our local teams, a local coach, and some amazing local players. Every time the ball is snapped, that's what I'm thinking about. That bomb is going to blow. I got to get there. We'll get up close and personal with the Colts' Dwight Freeney and find out how this former high school soccer player in Bloomfield became the NFL's most feared pass rusher. But can he stop the Giants' Tiki Barber this Sunday? That's all I want. I, am I being selfish? I just want the ring. The Giants and Patriots' super plans, plus the super young coach of the Jets, Hartford's Eric Mangini. I love Hartford. Uh, I, lo I love the city. Uh, incredible uh, childhood there. Plus, we'll see if John Madden's Super Bowl pick is the same as yours. And we'll check in with former Husky turned Detroit Lion Dan Orlovsky. The NFL on NBC 30 is back. But first, we introduce you to one of the NFL's most feared players. A guy who grew up right here in Connecticut. Buckle your chin strap. You're about to meet the Colts' Dwight Freeney.
This game is a violent game. It's controlled violence. I'm very laid back. And on the field, it's the complete opposite. I'm on a clock, and that clock is ticking. I got to defuse the bomb, and I have to defuse the bomb before it blows up. Every time the ball is snapped, that's what I'm thinking about. That bomb is going to blow. I got to get there. He usually does. No one reaches the quarterback faster or more often than Colts Pro Bowl defensive end Dwight Freeney. His journey to the NFL began in Bloomfield. He'd be walking to the mirror, put his two hands up to his neck and run off. And I said, why is he always doing that? Then I asked him and he said, he's trying to make his neck muscles big so he can play football. I was like, man, I want to have a big neck like, you know, Superman or He-Man or, you know, that's my whole, you know, that was my whole thing. Well, now he has a 19 neck to prove it. He would have gotten even bigger in middle school, but wanted no part of the weights in his basement. I said, come on, Dwight. He said, you want to play some sports? You got to start to get used to these kinds of things. And he said, you're making me lift this stuff. I'm going to tell mommy. <laughs> I did not like football because I didn't understand it, number one. I, you know, coming from Jamaica, I know soccer. When he was on the soccer team, the, a lot of the boys was teasing him about uh, as soccer as a sissy sport. But no one said that after Freeney finally went out for football. After being the water boy as a freshman for his older brother's team at Bloomfield, Dwight put on the pads as a sophomore. He's been knocking people over ever since. You ever think the water boy would turn into an all pro? Uh, not back then, no. That's how I got a chance to see him play basketball, play baseball, play soccer, you know, he's a one of a kind. That good a natural athlete? The best I've seen ever. Freeney led Bloomfield to a state championship as a senior and also starred in basketball and baseball. I thought he probably could have could have could have made pro baseball. He was super, super talented out there. He was a center fielder. He could hit the ball a ton and he could go get it in the outfield. But chasing the quarterback earned him a scholarship to Syracuse, where he became an All-American in 2001, setting an NCAA record for forced fumbles and fumble recoveries in a season with 11. Syracuse ignored what schools like Penn State couldn't, Freeney's size. Penn State was calling us every single day. Went into Penn State and uh, they looked at me and looked at the numbers and was like, uh, you're not 6'4". Paterno, the great coach, turned Dwight down basically because he felt he was too short. And I always say, what am I doing? Am I, am I getting paid to post up and, and box out and block shots? I mean, you're talking about a difference of this. You know, instead of my eyes being here, my eyes are here. Some NFL teams shied away from the six foot one Freeney too, but the Colts fell in love with Freeney's speed, quickness, and power, and picked him 11th overall in the first round of the 0-2 draft. It's not about how tall you are, it's about how big your heart is and how hard you want to play. But it's not easy racking up 51 sacks in your first four NFL seasons. 500 pass attempts in a year. I only have 11 sacks. That is a lot of failure, a lot of failing, right? But yet you're still considered one of the best. You know, I fail more than 95% of the time. I mean, there's so much room for improvement. A scary thought for teams trying to stop it. As a competitor, he's one of those guys that you have to deal with down in, down out, and can ruin a game pretty quickly just by the, the sheer impact he can have. But Freeney wants to make his greatest impact on society. He's involved in a number of charities, including his own camp for kids in Indiana. You know, I really got to give back to the community. It's something that touches me more than having kids enjoy themselves and, and, and just be motivated for something. All this glory and glamour, you know, that we all see all the time with, 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 with athletes. You know, Dwight Freeney has, has still stayed Dwight Freeney. He hasn't forgotten his community. Uh, Dwight has given um, tens of thousands of dollars to various charities here in the, uh, the greater Hartford area. He's 
is thinking that after football, that's where he's going to concentrate most of his efforts. Like um, Centers for Children, he has that at heart because he loves kids. Right now, Dwight Freeney's main focus is on football and winning a Super Bowl. And it's hard for him to imagine ever growing tired of the game he loves. I have to be out there with no legs and no arms. I'll probably still try to go out there and roll around, <laughs> try to make a play, bite somebody's head off. I mean, that's just me. I mean, that's just how I do it. You know, I just like to have a good time and, and, and play this game, man. I'll, you know, I'll play for free. Yes, but that will not be an issue. He's a free agent after this season and figures to get a huge contract. And Freeney will sure earn his money this weekend. That's right, Kev. The Giants and Colts square off in the first NBC Sunday night football game. It'll be Eli Manning versus big brother Peyton. But the Giants' key offensive weapon could be running back Tiki Barber. 2005 was a career season for the Giants' Tiki Barber, who broke his own team record with 1,860 rushing yards. That's the second most all-purpose yards in league history. So this season, what can Barber do to top that? Individually, probably nothing. Um, collectively, I can win a Super Bowl. I think I've realized that I have these great seasons, and they're, they're great for me. Um, I think it's exciting for the fans. But ultimately, what we all want is a Super Bowl ring. Despite the numbers, 2005 certainly didn't end the way Barber would have liked. After New York was embarrassed with a playoff loss to Carolina, Barber was critical of the coaching staff. I think in some ways we're out coached. Um, they had more intensity than we did. They played cons more consistently than we did. And uh, that's why they won this game. It wasn't acceptable. It wasn't acceptable what happened after that, after the, in, in that playoff game. Uh, there, was, there was tension there afterwards. And, and I understand why he felt such, felt that way. Um, but I've never seen, never not looked eye to eye with was Coach Coughlin. I'm right on board with him. Um, however, he also needs to be on board with his players. One enduring memory from last season was the way the Giants played after losing both of their owners, Wellington Mara and Bob Tisch. After Mara's death, the team went out and pounded the Redskins 36 zip. Barber led the way, rushing for 206 yards. That was a special day for me. Um, the week was just unbelievable how it all played out with me having an opportunity to say goodbye to him. Um, and then uh, having the day I did against one of our biggest rivals, and uh, I'll never forget that day. So as the 2006 season is upon us, the 31-year-old barber, like other giant veterans, says this is the season for New York to finally get that elusive Super Bowl ring. I know it's going to come to an end eventually. I just want the ring. That's all I want. I, am I being selfish? I just want the ring. Tiki, Eli, Jeremy Shockey, and so many other weapons. Why many think the Giants can make the Super Bowl. I'm not sure the Super Bowl is very realistic, realistic for the Jets, but it's pretty amazing that a 35-year-old guy from Hartford is trying to lead them there. How Eric Mangini went from ball boy to Jets golden boy and the youngest head coach in the NFL. That's next on NFL Kickoff 2006. BMW of North Haven is the number one volume certified pre-owned BMW dealer. We do it with competitive pricing and special finance rates. And the largest inventory of certified pre-owned BMWs in the state. These vehicles may look new, but they're priced thousands below original MSRP. You can't afford not to stop by. BMW of North Haven, centrally located right off I-91 and the Merritt. Just 30 minutes from Hartford and Fairfield counties. Come see how competitive we can be. Well, hello. Call or visit your local Geico office. Everyone is on the Connecticut Homeland Security Team. So if you see something suspicious, say something. Please call 1-866-HLS-TIPS, a 24-hour hotline where anyone can report suspicious activity happening near their home, in their community, or at their workplace. All calls will be kept confidential, and every call will be investigated. So if you see something suspicious, say something. Please call 1-866-HLS-TIPS or contact your local police department.
chip. Foxwoods, the wonder of it all. You're watching an NBC 30 special presentation, NFL Kickoff 2006. Welcome back to NFL Kickoff 2006. Now, the leader of gangrene is very green. Eric Mangini coaches his first NFL game Sunday at the ripe old age of 35. But his experience with the Patriots under Bill Belichick makes Mangini wise beyond his years. Yet nothing made him mature faster than the untimely death of his father and the challenges he faced growing up in Hartford. To me, that's the great thing about dreams is, is that you have a chance to, to constantly chase them. It's something Eric Mangini has done well, chase his dreams. When Mangini accepted the job to coach the New York Jets last January, he became the youngest coach in the NFL. At 35, he's about to embark upon his first season as a head coach. It has been said that Eric Mangini is a man wise beyond his years. You know, I, I don't really have any point of reference uh, <laughs> besides w where I am right now, but I'm, uh, I'm really committed to, to doing the best possible job that I can do every single day. And we're working incredibly hard to, uh, to achieve our goals, and, and that's what, what we're focused on. Mangini's focus and commitment were evident years earlier when he was growing up in Hartford, the youngest of the Mangini children. He was determined. He made up his mind to something, and. And he went for it, and he um, put everything he could into it. it. It was that was his makeup. Mangini says he started playing football as soon as he could. The kids would organize Sunday games in Foster Heights Park before the NFL games, and when they weren't at a park, he could find them in the streets playing football. Organized football came years later in eighth grade when he attended spring training here at Buckley High School. Mangini would then be a student here as well. Buckley was a, a fantastic time. I think it's a great high school. A lot of, uh, a lot of great teachers who, who work incredibly hard and, and they face some challenges that maybe other teachers don't face. And I, I was always impressed with how they met those challenges and, and how much they cared about kids. Buckley was back then similar to what it is today, a high school with a diverse student population. And that background helped Mangini throughout his career. Any time that, that you can be exposed to, to the different different cultures and, and different types of people, it always helps when when you are relating to people, whether it be in business or, or in your personal life. And I think it was an invaluable experience. I loved Hartford. Uh, I, lo I love the city. Uh, incredible uh, childhood there. But then, as a teenager, Mangini was dealt a terrible blow the death of his father, Carmen. When I was 16, my father died playing racquetball with my brother. And it was one of those situations where uh, a little overweight, very competitive, um, was, was, was probably even very competitive that day. And it just happened suddenly. It was uh, a crushing blow to all of us. It was very sudden. He was only 16, so it's very difficult. A network of family, friends, and coaches stepped in to help Mangini, who took away a great life lesson from his dad's death. You realize at that point how fragile life is and how important it is to thank the people that, that men mean so much to you and, and don't wait to say, I love you, and, and don't wait to, to say all the things that you want to say. And it also crystallized how important it is to, to capitalize on, on the moment and not worry about the future and not worry about the past, but do the best you possibly can at that moment because you, you just don't know what's gonna happen. It's an attitude reflected in his career. He goes for what he wants. And in his pursuit of a career in the NFL, Mangini's first job in the league was that of a ball boy with the Cleveland Browns. I was a 23-year-old ball boy, had graduated from Wesleyan with a political science major with a concentration in American politics. And there were a lot of people who were confused by the, by the decision to, to go into football on that level. But I just saw it as an opportunity to get in the door. And I thought, if I could get in the door, it might be hard to get me out. 
Someone who did take notice of Mangini back then was Bill Belichick, who gave him an assistance job on his Cleveland staff. It was the beginning of a professional decade-long relationship that ended when Mangini took the job with the Jets. Bill is, a, is an incredible friend. He, he's been an incredible mentor. And I can't thank him enough for, for the things that he's done and the things that, that he's taught me. And, and as a friend, he, he knew that this was a great opportunity and he'll be a friend for life and, and I'll always value that, that relationship. I've got an extensive foundation to build the New York Jets and the Super Bowl caliber franchise. Um, I just always knew that he would accomplish his goals. He just, that, that type of person. When you enjoy and love what you're doing, I think it um, automatically comes that you will be successful in your endeavors, whatever you choose to do. And he's very focused. I, I just knew he was going to make it. Yeah. Uh, we're focused on getting better every day, building um, on, the, on the mistakes that we made and on the, the learning that we we have each day and, and that's what that's what I'm looking for from the players, from the coaches, and from the organization. I think every little boy that plays football dreams of, of having some sort of career in the NFL and uh, this is an exciting opportunity and uh, it's, it's been a great experience for, for me personally, for my family and uh, I'm just really focused on, on the opportunity and doing the best job that I can. Mangini's Jets open the season Sunday at Tennessee. Patriots, meanwhile, start the 06 season Sunday at home with the Bills. And when they do, they'll be without three players they lost to free agency. Willie McGinnis, David Givens, and Adam Vinatieri, who helped the Pats win three Super Bowls in four years. From 41 yards, looks good. But what the Pats still have is quarterback Tom Brady, who goes into the 2006 season with a 68-21 record, the best record of any NFL QB in the Super Bowl era with at least 40 starts. You know, this team has a great opportunity ahead. And you know, we got a tough division, a bunch of new coaches, a bunch of new players. Um, and, and the nice part is we're all starting at the same point. So whoever works the hardest, Whoever sustains, uh, you know, the, the high level of play that it takes to get to a championship and, and to win a division, that's what that's what we're trying to accomplish. And the Patriots have safety Rodney Harrison back. He missed most of last season after tearing three ligaments in his knee. Harrison says he's heard all about his recovery. He's 33 years old. He'll never play again. Mm. That's all the motivation I need. You can see that one coming. It's Rodney Harrison. Feels really good. Um, all things considered, it's been a long time. So um, a lot of nervous excitement, but finally felt good to come out here. And reuniting feels good for Tabucky Jones. The New Britain native's back with the Pats after spending some time away with the Saints and the Dolphins. But there's still a big question mark for the past. Wide receiver Dion Branch has filed two grievances against the team and remains a holdout. When a return, he had the heart of a lion at UConn. Now Dan Orlowski thinks he can quarterback the Detroit Lions. We'll check in on the pride of Shelton next on NFL Kickoff 2006. NBC, we're back in football. Let's go! Go, go! The NFL season kicks off on NBC tonight when the Super Bowl champion Steelers take on the Dolphins. The champs are back. With music by Rascal Flatts and Diddy. Then Sunday, the premiere of Sunday Night Football on NBC as the Colts take on the Giants, where for the first time ever, it's Manning versus Manning. Doesn't get any better than this. Kickoff weekend starts tonight on NBC. Sesame Street Live, Elmo Makes Music is coming to the Hartford Civic Center, and NBC30 is giving away tickets. Winners will receive a family four-pack to the show, and the grand prize winner gets four tickets plus a $500 gift certificate to Joey's. Register at any Connecticut Joey's location. Awesome TV. Where'd you get it? Bernie's. They delivered it, set it up, whole nine yards. Wow, they do it all. Chips. Um. Service, selection, savings. Bernie's brings it home. Service, selection, savings. Bernie's brings it home. It's our largest flat screen event of the year. Get LG's 42-inch plasma for only $15.99. And no down payment, no payments, and no interest for 24 months on any LG TV. Bernie's brings it home.
The world's largest retailer of hot tubs is having a factory liquidation sale. For two days only, choose from over 100 Thermospa hot tubs. New units slightly scratched up to 60% off. Trade-ins as low as $5.99. Chemicals and accessories up to 70% off. And see our new revolutionary swim spa on sale. Thermospa's liquidation sale is this Saturday and Sunday from 10 to 6 at the Mass Mutual Center in Springfield, Mass. For directions, call 800-833-SPAS. Sesame Street Live's Elmo Makes Music is coming to the Hartford Civic Center, and NBC30 is giving away tickets. Winners will receive a family four-pack to the show, and the grand prize winner gets four tickets plus a $500 gift certificate to Joey's. Register at any Connecticut Joey's location. You're watching an NBC30 special presentation, NFL Kickoff 2006. Welcome back to NFL Kickoff 2006. It was a decent training camp for former UConn Husky Dan Orlovsky. Yeah, Persef, it may not be this season, but Orlovsky believes that it's only a matter of time before he takes over for John Kitna as the Lions starting QB. Orlovsky trying to win the number three job. It's the one biggest thing right now you need to work on to, to become a starter. Stop trying to be so perfect. My, my owner said to me, I want to be so good that it gets in the way of myself. And if I can just realize, just trust myself and, and I am a good player, then it'll just take care of itself. Dan Orlovsky enters year two of his NFL career more confident than ever. He's worked his way up the depth chart in Detroit, impressed former head coach turned Lions offensive coordinator Mike Martz. I'm a lot more confident. I think uh, I'm just chomping at the bit. I've never had uh, a year go by where I wasn't the guy, and, and I want that feeling back, you know. And, um, I just look at it as a huge opportunity to learn under a guy like Coach March and John Kitna. I'm looking forward to it. I'm doing everything possible I can to be the guy and help our team win games and, and Super Bowls. And I said when I got drafted there, my goal was to win Super Bowls, and that hasn't changed. It may be a while before Orlovsky wins a Super Bowl, but he did win a Motor City Bowl in Detroit. And playing for Randy Edsel at UConn and offensive coordinator Rob Ambrose gave Orlovsky the background to avoid being a permanent NFL backup. I mean, how much did Coach Edsel prepare you for this? Where, where I can't put into words, him and Coach Ambrose. But I really think, I really, really, really think it started in high school with Coach Benanto and my father and, and how they prepared me. And then I just, I just went step up, step up, step up. And I've just been so fortunate to have the people and coaches around me. And, and uh, but Coach Edsel and Coach Ambrose were really the final, final guys to prepare me. And that's why I think I'm, I'm having some success right now in people's eyes is I'm ahead of the learning curve. He really is, but the Super Bowl, probably unrealistic for Orlovsky and the Lions right now. But how about the Patriots, Giants, Steelers, or Colts? Hall of Famer John Madden unveils his pick. See if it matches yours. If it does, you could win tickets to see the Pats. That's next on NFL Kickoff 2006. NBC30.com with Weather Plus. Streaming online. Forecast tailored to your zip code. Accurate. Live and always on. Weather Plus on NBC30.com, Connecticut's online news leader. Say goodbye to water problems. Call Connecticut's well water specialists, Greco and Haynes. Day or night, seven days a week, Greco and Haynes will service any water system, and there's never an overtime charge. If you're building a home, need a redrill or fracking, the professionals at Greco and Haynes will coordinate the process, customize, and install your complete water system. Make sure your well and water system are safe and efficient. Call Greco and Haynes. Water is their only business. Mercedes-Benz of North Haven is going to become the number one volume Mercedes-Benz dealer. We know what it takes. The lowest competitive price, a world-class service right on premises. Select from one of the largest inventories of new and certified pre-owned Mercedes-Benz in the state. You can't afford not to stop by. Mercedes-Benz of North Haven, centrally located right off I-91 in the Merritt, just 30 minutes from Hartford and Fairfield counties. You can't afford to go anywhere else. Just because my Hearthstone bedroom is only $9.99, don't think it's inferior quality. Here's one of my A salesmen, Tim. It's solid wood. Solid, solid, solid. That's what I'm talking about. There are sets out there for over $5,000 with stapled drawers. The Hearthstone has wood drawers with dovetailing front and back. It's even dustproof. Indisputable quality, only $9.99. That's what I'm talking about. And it's good to go in three days or less. That's what I'm talking about.
NBC 30, partners in a caring community. You're watching an NBC 30 special presentation, NFL Kickoff 2006. Welcome back, the moment you've all been waiting for. NBC analyst John Madden gives us his pick to win Super Bowl 41. If you had to pick one team right now to win the Super Bowl, who would it be? Uh, boy, that's, that's tough. I mean, I would probably pick the Colts. And 25 of you guessed correctly which team John Madden would pick, but only one of you who chose the Colts was randomly selected to win two tickets to see the Patriots and Broncos. The winner is Carol Hansen from Manchester. Congratulations. Carol wins two tickets to see the Pats play at Gillette Stadium on Sunday night, September 24th. And, of course, you can also watch the game that night right here on NBC30. And that's going to do it for NFL Kickoff 2006. We want to thank our producer extraordinaire, Don Laviano, photographer, editor, Superman, Daryl Velez, and everyone behind the scenes who helped out. Absolutely great work, as always. So for Persephone Contos, I'm Kevin Nathan. Stay tuned. The Dolphins and defending world champion Steelers are next. The NFL is back on NBC 30. Have a great night, everybody. He was known as the terror of Fiddlefield. He had more interceptions in a season than any player in school history. He carried the fabled Red Devils to their first undefeated season in 52 years. He was the most feared defensive player that was under six foot and weighed less than 200 pounds and played Division III ball in history. Now, Kevin Nathan is ready for the National Football League. The NFL is back on NBC 30. We're ready. Are you? This is an NBC 30 special presentation. Rensselaer Field kickoff. Williams starts in motion to the right. Play action pass. They look for the left side. He's got Collins at the three. Touchdown, Connecticut. New stadium, new atmosphere. It's a crazy atmosphere. Everybody in Connecticut is excited for football right now. That's got to pump you up. And we're pumped too. You're looking at Rensselaer Field in East Hartford where the Yukon Huskies kick off the new season in their new stadium tomorrow at noon against Indiana University. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Wrencher Field Kickoff. I'm Kevin Nathan along with Brian Shackman. Obviously, Kevin, so much excitement surrounding this game tomorrow and the season in general. Tonight, we're going to show you why. Profiling a young and talented backfield, we're going to show you a side of Yukon coach Randy Etzel you have never seen. Plus, just how different Rensselaer Field is from the old Memorial Stadium. But first, coming off a 6-6 six and six season with almost everybody back and heading into the Big East next season, UConn is so confident, Brian, that dare we say it, they're talking about going to a bowl game. And the reason they're so confident is the way they ended last season, knocking off Iowa State on the road, a Big 12 team that at one point was ranked in the top 10. Cauley going to right, turns the corner, 35, 40. Here's Cauley, breaks into the open, up the right sideline. It's a foot race. They won't catch him. Mighty Mouse to the house. Touchdown, Connecticut. Felt like we won the Super Bowl. It really did. I think that was the biggest win in the program's history. Marlowski looks, lobs, and he's got to be an open. Touchdown. Touchdown, West Tipco. After the Ohio State game, it took him about 15 minutes to get us to shut up. That win for us is a, a big win. That could catapult us to the, the next level. That put us on the, the national map. We got national recognition for that game. Play action pass. Orlovsky looks, fires, home run ball. Jason Williams be out of the better. Got it at the 10, at the 5. Touchdown! Touchdown, Connecticut! It helps us put a chip on our shoulder to know that we can go out and play with teams like that. The Huskies' four-game winning streak that ended the 2002 season took four long, hard years of work. In the three previous seasons, the senior class lost 24 games, yet never lost hope. In the beginning years, it was rough. What is happening now is what you wanted to happen when you were a freshman. What they did for this program really can't be appreciated as much as you know we want it to be. They've done so much as far as really putting through the tough times and getting us to the stadium and now getting us to the Big East. Once in a while, you just gotta like look around and be like, 
We've been through hell. You want to win for them because you feel like they deserve it because they put, they put a lot into this program. The Huskies tri-captains epitomize the seniors' persistence. Sean Feldison is the quiet leader, a former walk-on kicker who became a starter and an inspiration. His is leadership by example. Fellow tri-captain Uya Sunday converted from linebacker to defensive end, and the sack specialist now can convert any UConn football non-believers. Uya's a, more of a philosopher. And then there's Sean Mulcahy's leadership philosophy. The senior defensive tackle from Westport backs down from no one. He's really going to say what's on his mind. The captains will lead a team loaded with talent. The offense returns eight starters, including All-American candidate tackle Ryan Krug, junior quarterback Dan Orlovsky, and running back phenom Terry Cauley. Add to that a defense that finished ranked 19th in the country last season in points allowed, and the Huskies can't wait to strut their stuff at Rensselaer Field. The expectations are high, but that's what you want as a coach. You know, we want to set the bar high. The goal of the season is to do better than last season. I feel that we have everyone healthy at the, throughout the whole year, and we play to up to our capability, that we shouldn't get beat. Some of the players we interviewed actually are talking about going undefeated, Brian. No, no question they have confidence in their talent and their ability, and no places are more talent on this team than in the backfield. Yeah, undefeated might be a little bit much, but when it comes to confidence and talent, the quarterback and two running backs are going to exceed expectations. Mighty Mouse to the house, touchdown Connecticut. Their stats don't lie. A perfectly thrown ball by Orlovsky. That's why they're that good. Touchdown, touchdown Connecticut. Just exactly who are they? First, Dan Orlovsky, the junior quarterback, deemed the franchise upon arrival. Then Terry Colley, nicknamed Mighty Mouse, and the second best freshman tailback in the entire nation last year. Finally, Deion Anderson, like Colley, played as a true freshman. Unlike Colley, very few noticed his hits and his heart on the field. Also unlike the quiet Colley, Anderson's what they call a character. It's almost like a psychotic person on the football field. He's football smart, though. Deion's just, you know, a head case fullback. You know, he just doesn't care. He just plows away. Deion is just he's a beast. That's all I can describe him as. Deion Henderson is just huge and crazy, which is what you want for a fullback. If you don't believe them, how about asking Anderson his thoughts and playing at the new Rensselaer Field? It's our doghouse. <laughs> and whoever comes into the doghouse should be ready for a dog fight. <laughs> like, I'm so, and I'm, thinking about it right now, and I just want to jump around. And, uh, uh, <laughs> well, how about asking him for his rendition of the backfield rap? Messing with the offense, you better be ready to attack because me, Dan, and Terry, oh, we're just straight big backs. It's Anderson's frenetic energy matched by Collie's quiet nature, and at five foot seven, possibly the most naturally talented, begging the question, how does he do it? I, I don't know. He's one of the most explosive people I've ever seen. And he, his agility is just abnormal. He's a little bit of a freak in terms of his uh, ability level. I mean, he has an ability that not a lot of guys have. He's a really hard guy to knock off his feet. He's not a guy you go out and you watch on high school film and you say, you know, we can pick up one of those guys every day. I mean, he's an unusual talent, I think. The quietly talented freak and the loyally ferocious beast brings us to Orlovsky. No outlandish name and maybe not the most talent, but a pure thrower, more importantly, a pure leader and the hardest worker on the team. For me as a coach, you know, I have to pull the reins back on him more so than, you know, telling him, hey, you got to do this, you got to do that. And that's what you want as a coach. He's a great leader. You know, he's, he's a vocal leader and he leads by example. He does the extra stuff that makes me want to do a little extra too. I just want to lead by example and, if, you know, something needs to be said, I'll say it, but I'm not a guy who's going to rip you. You would think three so-called kids taking over an offense would create resentment, but actually, it's been the opposite. If they're starting, there's a reason for it. I'm not going to try and knock on the guys who I played with four years ago, but there's a drastic change in the talent level between that time and right now. So I just went out there, gave it my all, and it's like, uh, no, nah, they, they, they were very accepting. In the end, Anderson doesn't need publicity. If the team wins and he gets to hit people, he's fine. But Orlovsky and Cauley, they're striving to impress a lot of people. I always tell Terry that I expect for him and I to be the best one-two punch in the country next year. Perfection, that's what we want to accomplish, perfection.
As many of you know, Orlowski, a nutmeg native from Shelton. He's coming off a sophomore season with great experience and numbers. 19 touchdowns, just 11 interceptions, completing 60% of his passes, and with two years left, people expect those numbers only to get better. And one of the reasons, Brian, that Orlowski had so much success was the running of Mighty Mouse. Five foot seven Terry Colley really did save the day. The freshman All-American put up senior-like numbers. 15 rushing touchdowns, 1,247 yards, and a 5.7 yards a carry average. And the best part, the pride of Lusby, Maryland is back for three more seasons. When we come back, he learned to coach under Dick McPherson and Tom Coughlin. And after a rough beginning, Randy Etzel has made believers out of his players. An in-depth profile of the man behind the whistle. You're watching Rensselaer Field kickoff on NBC 30. Welcome back to Rensselaer Field kickoff. The Yukon Huskies take on Indiana here tomorrow. We'll tell you all about the Hoosiers in a moment, but first, Randy Edsel, like you've never seen him before. Like many coaches, the man leading the Huskies through the tunnel tomorrow was once a player himself. That's Randy Edsel. During his playing days in the late 70s at Syracuse, he was a backup quarterback for the Orange. Look at that textbook form. All kidding aside, Kevin, Etzel was all state in high school in football, basketball, and baseball in Glenrock, Pennsylvania. But now he's all business, and that serious approach has made a serious impression on his UConn team. He wants to win, and he's going to do everything it takes to win. He won't hold nothing back. If you get held up one-on-one, -on -one, we got to find somebody different to play. And you can't help but get excited when your coach is jumping up and down, yelling up and down the sideline as we're starting to make plays. You better be fast if you're going to beat him just like that. I've never been around a head coach that has as much a handle and expertise on both sides of the football as he does. How high does he set the expectations of the program? High. Very high. We can go out there and have a, a great day of practice, but they'll be like, you know, it was decent today. You may not think he's watching you, but uh, he'll pull you aside and give you a little talk. Two interceptions already? That's crazy. Someday, Randy Edsel could be the talk of college football. In his five seasons at UConn, he's patiently persevered through the slow, difficult process of turning UConn into a competitive Division I program. I think it was a tremendous amount of pressure on him the first year here to produce. This is a program that he was going to more or less be the Messiah and take it into big time college football. And when things weren't happening right away, I, you know, I mean, I guess I felt empathy for him, but he just kept trucking. He's grown a lot as a coach. I mean, he was his first time as a head coach when he came here. The captains were talking to him the other day and he said he's still learning how to be a better leader, but he's learned a lot since he's been here. He was definitely the reason why people kept believing. I mean, at least within the team. It's because you just saw how much he wanted and how much, you know, how much work and how much dedication he had to this program. He refused to let this, this thing fail. And it's finally starting to pay off. What I tried to do, Kevin, was to get the program to be as strong as we could be as the first year we've gone that we go into the stadium. Edsel accomplished this by sometimes micromanaging the smallest of details, but he has never lost sight of his most valuable asset, his players. Coach Edsel's like the little angel and devil that sit on your shoulder and just talk to you 24 hours a day. You know, you see him and he, it's high in house class, house football. Are you doing everything the right way? And he knows about everything. If that's the way they feel, then I feel good about that. You know, I have a son at home in Corey, but I also have 105 other sons. You know, if you went out and had a burger and a soda at Friendly's, he knows what you ate. He does everything the right way. He takes no shortcuts. In college football, those are the things that you, you can have influence and you can change, help to change people's lives and you can help develop young men a lot quicker. He's very straightforward. He's a straight shooter. He tells you what's expected of you and he tells the players what's expected of them. And uh, he's a guy that's a tremendous hard worker. But it's not easy. Edsel has a wife and two kids and during the season starts his day at a quarter to five in the morning. You're making a lot of sacrifices, Kevin, but you really don't feel like you are because you really enjoy what you're doing. Edsel's passion for the game is contagious and constant. Does he ever let his guard down? No, never, never. 
never. And that's what, what makes him one of the you know best coaches, I think. He's so regimented. Does he ever let his guard down? It almost seems like he's fake, huh? Like he puts up a front all the time, but he's that way around us all the time too. And um, I think it's just, he has a, a great personality. And um, I think he's the perfect fit for this situation. It's no fluke, Brian, that Edsel's been the perfect fit at UConn. Former UConn athletic director Lou Perkins knew Edsel had an impressive coaching background. After his playing days at Syracuse, Edsel coached the Orange for a decade working his way up from graduate assistant to recruiting coordinator. He was part of that Syracuse staff that coached the Orange to an undefeated season in 1987, then left for Boston College and the Jacksonville Jaguars, where he coached under former Syracuse assistant Tom Coughlin. And after one year as Georgia Tech's defensive coordinator, the former QB turned defensive coaching whiz came to UConn in 1999. And from the moment Edsel came here, Kevin, he's had endless conversations about the new stadium. Well, tomorrow it finally opens. And Edsel and his players will not miss the old one. Brian memorializes Memorial Stadium and shows us all the excitement of Rensselaer Field. That's next. You're watching Rensselaer Field Kickoff. The field is set, the goal posts are up, and finally, after years of speculation, debates, planning, and construction, Rensselaer Field is ready for football. And I can't wait. Welcome back to Rensselaer Field kickoff, where tomorrow the Yukon Huskies finally open this $91 million Rensselaer Field 40,000 seat masterpiece. And you know, for many, Kevin, just having this field validates the UConn football program, but for Husky players, especially the older ones, tomorrow isn't just a football game, it's going to be an emotional experience. Just walking through the tunnel to go out there, you start to get the chills, and you know, you can't wait for game day when you come out and the place is packed and everybody's ready to go. It's simple. To be a big time program, you need a big time venue. We can't be a Florida State, a Miami playing a Memorial Stadium. We need a real stadium with some fans to get behind us. I purposely registered so that I could play in the new stadium, and I, and I think this is going to be a turning point for, for the UConn program. You heard it right. Sean Feldeisen spending another year of his life in stores just for the chance to walk on a Rensselaer Field for a football game. That's the first thing people talk to me about. It's the stadium, the first game. You go from whatever that thing is, 15,000 that stay, uh, stands in there to 40. When I stepped foot in that when it was completely done and closed. It's like, we're playing in this six times next year. This is our home field. As far as Memorial Stadium goes, emotions run from nostalgia to respect to relief. For me, I always hated playing in Memorial Stadium. I, I just couldn't wait to get into a, a bigger and better stadium. Of course, I played my, my first collegiate game there and, you know, my three, three years there. I mean, part of my heart will always be there, obviously, but... I've been waiting for this for 40 years. Memorial, 50 years the home of UConn football. Tomorrow, no longer that, but not a memory either because it remains the place where each and every player has a memory of running up and down those stairs until exhaustion. We put a lot of time and blood and sweat into those stadiums over there and, you know, as much as we hate that place, we'll, we won't like to see it go because it's really helped us out a lot with our condition and we're just coming together as a, a team. Of course, Indiana tomorrow, then Army in week two, and then September 13th, the Huskies return home for New England rival Boston College. That'll be fun. Yes, it will. Then Buffalo and a tough Virginia Tech on the road before returning home for Lehigh and family weekend. Then it's off to NC State, the Wolfpack ranked in the top ten in many of the preseason publications. Then UConn begins a three-week stretch against Mid-American Conference schools. These MAC games all very winnable. And the last home game will be against Rutgers before the Huskies end the season on the road at Wake Forest. But first things first, UConn, Indiana. Now, the Hoosiers aren't in the upper echelon of the Big Ten, but they still play the likes of Ohio State and Michigan. So a road game in Connecticut not going to phase them at all. No way. The Hoosiers will be led tomorrow by Notre Dame transfer quarterback Matt Lavecchio. He started for the Irish as a freshman. It's the Big Ten. Uh, they play against Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, so they know what physical football is all about. Uh, we just have to make sure that we go out and really focus on what we can do and what our strengths are, and if we do that, 
play sound defense, uh, put points on the board offensively, make no mistakes in the kicking game, then that gives us a chance to win. Indiana's coached by Jerry DiNardo, the former head coach at LSU, and Hamden's Josh Moore starts at linebacker for the Hoosiers. When we come back, Brian and I will make our bold predictions. Could a bowl game be in the forecast? And we'll show how much commitment it takes to prepare for a season as a Division I football player. You're watching Rensselaer Field kickoff on NBC30. Tomorrow at noon, a new era begins for UConn football. Welcome back to Rensselaer Field kickoff. All right, with all due respect to Brian, who's a hockey guy and all the other sports out there, I admit I'm biased, but there is nothing, Brian, like preparing to play college football. Maybe at the Division 1A level, I agree with Any you. Any level. But the Division Any 3 level. level, I'm not so sure. But seriously, the, the commitment that these guys show to get ready for a football season is incredible. And it's different than the old days when Kevin Nathan was doing it. <laughs> they still lift a lot of weights, but there's also almost as much running and agility. We ran. All to make these guys world-class athletes. Okay. If we're not the hardest working team in the country, there's not many around that work harder than us, and we, we truly believe that. Just the way we're working out and the intensity and the enthusiasm and the charisma of the team, it's just, it's like night and day, even compared to last year. I thought last year we had a great summer, and I think this year's summer is just, just one that we really need to get to where we want to be. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Yes, I do dread them, but... <laughs> I know that they're going to make me better. So The mental toughness that you get from doing those workouts, you, you start to feel like there's nothing that you can't do, even when your, your body's tired and your mind's telling you you can do more. All right, time now for our predictions. Brian, when I look at the UConn schedule, I only see two games if you go up and down at the really don't have much of a chance. NC State, right. Virginia Tech. The rest of the games they can win. If this team stays healthy, I think they go eight and four, maybe even nine and three. NFL prospect and quarterback in Dan Orlovsky, Terry Cauley and the emergence of Matt Lawrence in the running game, a swarming defense, eight and four. They beat Indiana 27 to 20 tomorrow. You know, for once, I, I kind of agree with Kevin. They have a, a really easy schedule relative to the rest of the country. I think eight and four is not out of the question. Even if they lose a game, we expect them to win. They could go seven and five, but I don't like seven and five. So I think they win 31-21 over Indiana, and they could go 8-4. and four. We are eternal optimists here. Keep everybody healthy, That's and they right. can do some great things. For Brian Shackman, I'm Kevin Aithen. Thanks for watching the Wrenchler Field kickoff special. Go, go, go. Come on, come on, come on. Off the back. Off the back. Off the back. Sit. This is an NBC 30 Connecticut News special presentation. The Boston Celtics return to glory. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our pre-game five special Boston Celtics return to glory. Lou Holder in studio, my partner in crime, Kevin Nathan, live inside a Continental Airlines arena. Game five between the Celtics and the Nets. A lot of cool stuff in store for you over the next half hour, but first, the immediate business at hand. Kev, what's the environment down there as we get ready for game five of the Eastern Conference Finals? Uh, I think people are getting pumped up, Lou. Tony Delk of the Celtics out here getting his warm-ups in. Keith Van Horn knocking down shots for the Nets just minutes ago. So much at stake tonight, Lou. This is game five, series tied at two. The winner of tonight's game really gets the leg up in this series. If the Celtics can win, they'll be just one win away from their first trip to the NBA Finals since 1987. Losing's painful whenever you lose, but our guys realize that this is a, a three-game series. And uh, everything that they've worked since probably a week after last season 
uh, is on the line. And they, they have a wonderful opportunity. And I think our guys are very, uh, uh, you know, my viewpoint, very upbeat, very focused. Uh, uh, I just mentioned to them that with the game at 9 o'clock, it's going to be a long day. And, uh, you know, it's going to be maybe the longest day of all time because we're anxious to play. Game time tonight, 9 p.m. right here on NBC 30. The Celtics just six wins away from a record 17th NBA championship. And you won't want to miss the first few minutes tonight. The Celtics have struggled early in games. That could be the key, getting off to a good start. Let's take a quick look back at the first four games of this series. Get ready. Tighten up the seatbelt. Enjoy the ride. In game one in New Jersey, the Nets' backcourt out-rebounded the Celtics' frontcourt. A recipe for disaster and a 104-97 Nets win. We feel good about this game, to tell you truthfully. Even though we lost, we kept it, you know, within range of, of coming back, you know, the whole game. The Salts rebounded in game two on the boards and on the scoreboard. Despite Jason Kidd's second straight triple-double, Antoine Walker's 26 points powered the Celts to a 93-86 win. In Game 3 in Boston, the Nets blew a 26-point lead. The Celts stormed back from a 21-point fourth-quarter deficit alone. The Boston Celtics with the greatest fourth-quarter comeback in NBA playoff history. Paul Pierce, the hero, with 21 of his 28 points in the fourth. It was purgatory. It, it might have been closer to hell for, for three uh, quarters. But that last one was uh, Eden. That was, damn, that was great. The Celts nearly made another heavenly comeback in game four, but there would be no repeat at the fleet. <laughs> Paul Pierce missed free throws in the final seconds that would have tied the game. Jersey won at 94-92, evening the series at two apiece. That's just the breaks of the game, and I'm willing to accept that, you know, because when we win, I get the credit, like I said before. When we lose, I take, I take the criticism, you know, I take the heat. And that's what makes Paul Pierce a superstar. Just to my left, I can see Pierce getting ready to come in here and take some warm-ups for game five. His teammates respect him for being a guy who takes accountability, win or lose. Lou, let's send it back to you. Thanks a lot for getting us started, Kev. We'll check back with you in just a bit. What a great time it is to be a New England sports fan. The Celtics are following the lead of the Pats, Bruins, and Red Sox, and that's bringing a winning tradition back to Beantown. The first Eastern Conference final since 1988 can be directly traced back to a comment made last season and the turnaround that has taken place since. Larry Bird's not walking through that door, fans. Kevin McHale's not walking through that door, and Robert Parrish is not walking through that door. And if you expect them to walk through the door, they're going to be gray and old. All this negativity that's in this town sucks. My, how things have changed in a short period of time. Rick Pitino and turmoil, out. Jim O'Brien and Celtic tradition, back in. And the Boston Celtics with the greatest fourth quarter comeback in NBA playoff history. The new school is bringing people back with a trusted franchise friend and the ability to create like Celtic stars of the past. You know, anything you want to write about Boston, you know, obviously you can write. It's always been about defense. And it's it's uh, anything we get offensively is a bonus. Me, with me and Paul, um, we have a very high confidence level, and um, it's basically a green light that we have offensively, not necessarily to take um, to go 14 for 52, but obviously to take good shots, get other guys involved, and when things are not going well for us, still be aggressive. And that's the comfort level that Coach O'Brien has instilled in us. With the series now the best of three and New Jersey holding home court advantage, the Celtics need the scoring and the maturing leadership of Antoine Walker, leadership that was never more evident than in that unforgettable game number three. Antoine was so positive and in timeout saying to Paul, you just take over this damn game. You just start carrying us. You just, you know, attack, attack, attack. Antoine, he's, he's one of our emotional leaders, and uh, you know, he's a guy I really have a lot of respect for. You know, he doesn't really get the credit I think he deserves as a team leader, as a captain of this ball club. Now, whatever happens tonight, there will be a game six at the Fleet Center on Friday. 
and that's a building that Walker and the rest of the modern day Celtics have made a hip and exciting place to be. To have this building, you know, get like um, the Boston Garden used to get, you know, to see that, to see the fans supportive and to see, you know, the other sports teams, you know, and then to see the Red Sox up there, to see, you know, them guys come out and support us. It makes you feel very good, man. This is a very um, big year for Boston sports and, you know, I'm glad we're a part of it. All right, neither the Nets nor the Celtics reached the playoffs last year, making this just the second time in league history that two teams are meeting in the conference final after failing to get to the postseason the previous year. The last time that happened was 1977. Here is your tale of the tape. Let's get it on. Celtics last year's record 36 and 46. This year, 49 and 33, first winning season since 92-93. Nets last year's record 26 and 56. This year, Byron Scott has turned it around 52 and 30. This is their first time ever in the conference finals. We are just getting started here on Boston Celtics Return to Glory. Later in the program, we'll show you how UConn is being represented at this Eastern Conference Finals. But up next, Kevin catches up with Celtic great Casey Jones. You are watching Boston Celtics Return to Glory. Welcome back to Boston Celtics Return to Glory, our half-hour special leading up to Game 5 of the Eastern Conference Finals between the Celtics and the Nets. Kevin Nathan is down in North Jersey taking in all the sights before the 9 p.m. start. Kev, what up? <laughs> like a Paul Pierce warming up behind me, Lou. K.C. Jones, a legend, NBA Hall of Famer, now lives in West Hartford. This is a guy who played on eight straight NBA championship teams with the Celtics and then, of course, coached the Celtics to championships in 84 and 86. Recently, I had a chance to get nostalgic with K.C. He talked about Celtics pride, Larry Bird predicting a last-second shot, Red, Russell, and more. The Celtics are leading 110 to 109. There are five seconds. Celtics pride. He gets it out deep and a half. Jack steals it. Over his back, Joe. Jack Casey Jones describes Celtics pride in two words. Team harmony. And for Jones, team harmony will always have a sweet ring to it. He won eight championship rings as a Celtics player and four more as a coach. His accomplishments would leave any player green with envy. Getting to the finals and, and winning eight, eight, eight championships in a row, that's, that's very difficult to do. And uh, uh, but, but what's involved in that is, is so much luck. Now there's a steal by Bird. Underneath the DJ. Right there. Right half one second left. What a play by Bird. But eight wasn't enough. Jones coached the last Celtics championship team in 1986. Even though Larry Bird sometimes got the last word and the last shot. I'm not diagramming the play. I said, all right, now, Kevin, you take it out of bounds and give it to Dennis. And then, and then Larry's the coach. He says, just give me the ball and tell everybody to get the hell out of the way. Uh, I said, okay, Larry, you play our coach, okay? I said, all right, now, Kevin, you take the ball out. Get it into Dennis. Dennis threw it to Larry. Everybody get the hell out of the way. And then he ran out of the timeout because he saw Xavier coming back on the court. He said, hey, Xavier, I'm getting the ball. And I'm going to take two dribbles to the left, and I'm going to step back and I'm going to stick it. And uh, so the ball is thrown inbound. Larry gets it, two dribbles to the left, steps back, and he shoots it. And his hand is still in the air, but as the ball leaves his hand, he's on his way to the dressing room. The ball goes through, the game's over. Um, so he did have some confidence. Jones credits his coach, Red Auerbach, for building the Celtics franchise into the greatest in NBA history. He gets Russell when nobody else in the pros wanted Bill Russell. Do you know why? They said he's too skinny, too short, and couldn't shoot. He is the guy that, that created this, this legendary basketball team. Jones remains a legend in his own right. Today, he works part-time in the University of Hartford Athletic Department, but he'll always be a full-time Celtics fan. Do you still root for the Celtics? The wild bears sleep in the woods? It's been much too long uh, since Kevin and Larry and, and Robert Parrish and those guys and hadn't been much to uh, jump up and down about. So it's, uh, so it's just great to see them back up there. And, and I take a lot of pride in, in, in seeing that 
they work their way up. And it is so great to hear those old audio clips from the late Johnny Most. He was the best. As for Casey Jones, he got the most out of his Hall of Fame career. Number 32, as we said, lives in West Hartford now. 12 championship rings. Unbelievable, Lou. But two of those were won as a Lakers assistant. I'm not sure he wears those around Connecticut very much. Not a popular thing in New England, the Lakers. Back to you. Thanks a lot, Kev. See you in a few. Casey Jones, not the only former Celtic sounding off about the new kids on the block. Another NBA Hall of Famer, Bob Cousy, is delighted that the tradition is back not only for his former team, but the region as a whole. It's been a wonderful season for New England sports fans. The Super Bowl, the Red Sox, uh, best record. Bruins have a heck of a year. And now wherever the Celtics go with this, it's, uh, it's regenerated all of that interest. So it's, it's fun and, uh, and exciting to be part of that. So whatever they've, uh, they've already, as, I, as we say, overachieved and overaccomplished in terms of uh, putting the Celtics back in, into the uh, spotlight. We are halfway through our preview special. When we return, we will tell you how stores is represented in this NBA conference final. But first, we want to test your cranium with some trivia. Which former Celtic was the only player to ever win consecutive NCAA champions, an Olympic gold medal, an NBA title? The answer when we come back. Welcome back to the program. Our trivia question, which former Celtic was the only player ever to consecutively win an NCAA championship, an Olympic gold medal, and an NBA title? The answer, Bill Russell, 1956 NCAA champ with the University of San Francisco, 1956, the Olympic gold medal, and 1957 NBA championship with the Celtics. Kevin Nathan joins us again from the Meadowlands. Now there is some UConn Husky representation in this Eastern Conference Finals. Kev, tell us what's up with New Jersey Nets Don, yeah, Donnie Marshall. Yeah, easy to get Danielle and Donnie confused, Lou. But yeah, Donnie Marshall, not the star of this Nets team, one of the last guys off the bench, but one of the first guys to lead the Nets in cheers. The NBA journeyman, who now makes his offseason home in Glastonbury, has found an NBA home here in New Jersey with the Nets. This is a guy who's been in and out of the league since coming out of UConn in 1995 as a second-round pick from Cleveland, and he appreciates reaching these Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, it's a dream come true for me. I mean, just like everyone's talking about a dream season for the New Jersey franchise, it's a dream come true for me. I mean, <clears throat> guys go through their whole career never getting to the point that we're at. So uh, the, through the roads that I've traveled, it, it, it truly is a blessing. You know, my, my hard work has finally paid off. Yeah, Donnie hugged Jason Kidd after game four when the Nets even the series at two apiece from the Connecticut pride for Donnie Marshall. But when the CBA folded, Donnie kept his NBA dream alive. And he still values all that he learned under Jim Calhoun as a UConn Husky. When I was at UConn when I first got there, uh, you know, I didn't play a lot and, and I knew I was going to have to work on my game and kind of change my game a little bit to kind of adapt to, to my surroundings being in the Big East. Here I had to do the same thing. I had a couple friends from uh, school that have a ring, Scott Burrell and Travis Knight, so I'll be third on the list if we get there and I, and I think we have a great chance of doing that. But it won't be easy getting that ring standing in the way of the Boston Celtics, winners of an NBA record 16 championships. When we come back, we'll analyze game five of these Eastern Conference Finals as you watch Paul Pierce and the Celts warm up here in East Rutherford, New Jersey. You're watching the Celtics return to glory. In the home stretch of Boston Celtics return to glory. Let's get to the analysis of this game and the rest of the series. Kevin Nathan chiming in from the Meadowlands. Kev, obviously the Celtics can't afford to get behind like they did in games three and four. Absolutely not, Lou. That's one of the things we're going to talk about with Hartford Current sports writer Jeff Goldberg. Thank you for joining us. Bit of a different beat for you. you covered the UConn women this year. There are no 39 0s here. Game's much closer, but one similarity Celtics coach Jim O'Brien, a Philly guy like Gino Oriema. Talk about Jim O'Brien and what he's done with this team since Rick Patino was fired a year ago when the Celtics were just 12 and 24. Well, I think the biggest thing with Jim is that he's just come in and he, he's not yelling at him the way Rick Patino yelled at him, and all those histrionics with Patino are, are gone now. 
involved. The, the team is responding to him, to Jim O'Brien. They're playing hard for him. And he's also put in a defensive system this year with the new rules. It's allowed them to be a much better defensive team. And, and those have been the biggest things. But it, it's like when Bill Fitch was fired from the Celtics in the 80s. Casey Jones took over, very laid back. Team responded. They won a title in his first year. And it's the same kind of thing. Hopefully for them, they would like to win a title in their first year. It also helps when you have a one-two punch like Paul Pierce and Antoine Walker, a couple of all-stars. A one-two duo, and I know we're going to get a phone call about this, that reminds me to a lesser degree of Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, same positions and the same type of leadership and huge scoring from those two. Well, Antoine Walker would agree with you because he's a Chicago guy. But, uh, yeah, they're not quite on the same talent level, but it is the same idea that the offense runs through the two of them. It's all up to Pierce. Pierce is the number one option. Walker is really the inspirational leader of the team. He's the emotional leader. We saw it going into that fourth quarter on Saturday, the way he got Pierce fired up. Uh, but they're going to need someone else to step up in, in this game. Uh, they need someone to be the Horace Grant uh, on this team. Maybe it's going to be Kenny Anderson. Maybe it's Tony Batty. Maybe Rodney Rogers. But someone else has to support Walker and Pierce if they're going to have any kind of success. Celts have owned the Nets in the fourth quarter in this series, particularly the now famous Game 3 when Boston erased a 26-point deficit. But they have struggled early. How important is it for the Celtics to come out early tonight and get this crowd out of the game? It's very important. It's the key. The last two games, the Celtics have trailed by 13, 15 points after one quarter they need to stay in the game they need to do what they did in game two which is take a first quarter lead they've outplayed the nets in the second halves of most of these games but they can't keep falling behind by 20 points and expect to come back and win it worked the first time it didn't work on monday not easy though when you're playing against six four point guard jason kidd of the nets who in my opinion was robbed when he wasn't the mvp of the league how integral is he to this nets offense and defense he is the offense i mean he makes everything go uh, the, everything that they do runs through him there's not a lot of tremendous this offensive talent beyond Kidd. I mean, they have some decent players, but Kidd makes the players around him better. That's why he's an MVP candidate. I think the best example is what he did at the end of game four. He was aggressively double teamed in that final play. He found the open man. He always finds the open man. He found Lucius Harris, who got fouled and made the free throws, and he just has tremendous vision. He knows where his teammates are, and he sets them up so they can succeed. Home court has not been much of a factor in this series. Each team has taken a game on the other team's court. Quickly, Jeff, prediction for the rest of this series. Well, I think if the Celtics get off to a decent start tonight. I think they can win this game. I said before the series that I thought the Celtics would win in six. I still believe that. I think they will win tonight. And I think they'll take care of their own home court in game six. Home court hasn't meant a whole lot in the series. Each team is one on the other team's floor. So I, I think the Celtics get a good start tonight. I think they will win this game. Terrific. Jeff Goldberg from the Hartford Current joining us. Appreciate it. And Lou, uh, I'll tell you what, I tend to agree with a lot of the things Jeff said. I think it's going to be critical for the Celtics to get off to an early start tonight. Take this bandwagon Nets fan base out of the game and the other key slowing down Keith Van Horn option number two for the Nets when he averages 17 points a game in this series the Nets win when he averages seven points they lose take Keith Horn, Van Horn out minimize Jason Kidd's impact and I think the Celtics win this game and move on okay Kev tell Jeff thanks for the love I agree with you totally <laughs> we got Donnie Marshall here <laughs> oh Donnie what's up man? Donnie we got a few seconds left in All the right. show what does it mean for you to be at this point? I know you're not getting a lot of PT, but just to be part of this, all the trials and tribulations to get to this point. This is huge. I mean, it's a dream season for the franchise, but it's also a dream season for me. I've worked hard over my career, starting day one at UConn and now to this point, and uh, it's just, okay. it, it really is a blessing c coming true for me. We've got about 10 seconds. Fitting you would mention dream season in a place where Tate George made the <laughs> late grade. It's Tate shot. That's right. I'm connected to a couple of different uh, great great games here and uh, hopefully another uh, another great season for us here in New Jersey. Good luck tonight. Donnie Marshall, thanks for joining us. Good luck. And that's going to wrap up the Boston Celtics return to glory. For Lou Holder, I'm Kevin Aitken, live from East Rutherford, New Jersey. Thanks for watching. everybody and welcome to this special edition of Sunday Sports Replay. I'm Kevin Nathan standing outside Blue Cross Arena live in Rochester where the Hartford Wolfpack are your 1999-2000 Calder Cup champions. What a game here tonight to show you. Game six of the Calder Cup finals, the AHL's equivalent of the Stanley Cup finals. Let's go to the highlights. A packed house here in Rochester, including some Wolfpack fans. 
Midway through the first period, Derek Armstrong falling down, makes it one nothing Hartford, then gets a little roughed up. Still in the first, some nifty puck work by Hamden's Todd Hall, and then bingo, it's two-zip Wolfpack. Still, first period, Johan Vitahal from Armstrong and Hall, it's three-zip Hartford. It stayed that way after one. In the second, Hamel beats J.F. LeBay, but that would be the only puck past the pack netminder. The Wolfpacks, Johan Vital adds an empty netter in the third, and that's all she wrote. The Wolfpack win the series in six games, 4-1 Hartford, the game six final. In just their third season in Hartford, the Rangers AHL affiliate brings home the championship. The Hartford Wolfpack, year 1999-2000, Calder Cup champions. Congratulations, the Calder <laughs> Cup's coming back to Hartford. We're gonna get Philly! We're gonna get Philly! We got our bounces, our power play has been terrible all playoffs, and finally it clicks in the big game. So this is such a team effort, you know, you, you can't take any individuals. And it's like I said, the MVP award should go to the whole team or, or JF LeBay. He's, he's stood in his head, you know, and he, you, know, you need good goaltender to win, and I dedicate that to everybody on the team. How sweet does it taste? <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, uh, three years in Hartford isn't that long to wait for something like this. It's been unbelievable. Worth the wait? It was worth the wait. You bet. Every bit of it. You know, we have had good teams here in the last couple of years, and we put, we put ourselves over the top this year. It took us 23 games here in the playoffs, and uh, we're, real, uh, we're real excited for not just the guys in here and stuff, but, uh, but just for the city of Hartford, you know, and the way they've, they've taken to us and stuff, and uh, we're real appreciative, and we hope we can have a big parade down Trumbull Street. Guy from Hamden, Connecticut's bringing home the cup. What does this mean? It's, it's an unbelievable feeling. Uh, I mean, uh, we got guys, tw 20 some odd guys, guys who played every game, guys who didn't, guys who didn't even play a game. I mean, we just came together, played as a team, and we're bringing the cup home to Hartford. Yes, they are. The bus has left here about 15 minutes ago. They should arrive back in Hartford oh, about 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning, feeling pretty good. Big celebration going on for the Wolfpack. We're going to have much more on their championship later in the show, including a look at head coach John Paddock, who won his fifth Calder Cup tonight, and the original four, the four members of the Wolfpack who have been here since day one. That's all coming up later on Sunday Sports Replay. NBA playoffs, Lakers-Blazers, Game 7 of the Western Conference Final, the winner to take on the Pacers in the finals. We go to L.A., there's Shaq, and here are the Lakers, down three in the fourth. Brian Shaw, the former Celtic, went for a three. We're tied at 75. Then it's Kobe Bryant with the J. Lakers pulling ahead, 83-79. Then the play of the game, you saw it right here on NBC 30, Kobe to Shaq on the alley-oop. The Lakers go back to the championship for the first time since 1991, 89, 84. And you can watch game one of the NBA Finals right here on NBC 30, Lakers and Pacers Wednesday night. Baseball, the Red Sox trying to break a four-game losing streak. Boston at Philadelphia, where Jimmy Williams is sure getting production from this guy. Carl Everett, two on in the third for Everett, and see you later. Everett's 19th home run of the year. Is he on a roll or what? Sox up five zip. But Jeff Becerra, who's been brilliant this year, got roughed up, couldn't hold the lead. Pat Burrow takes him deep. One of three dingers Becerra gave up today. We go to extra innings in the 12th, met on second and third. Kevin Jordan flies to center. It goes over Everett's head with the drawn in outfield, and that's it. Philadelphia beats the Red Sox in 12 final with six to five. The Yankees at Atlanta. Braves pitcher John Rocker went off on Sports Illustrated writer Jeff Perlman before the game, the guy who wrote that article about Rocker before the season. Bottom five, Kilvio Veras tries to go over Jeter's head. Not going to happen. Jeter with the over-the-shoulder catch in the sixth now. After Javi Lopez went deep, it's Reggie Sanders' turn. Back-to-back -back home runs for the Braves. They make a 6-4 game, a 6-6 tie. But in the seventh, Clay Bellinger pinch hitting. Clay Bellinger, you've got to be kidding me. A pinch hit home run. That puts the Yankees 
up for good. They go on to win it 7-6, and the Bombers now a game up on the Red Sox in the American League East. The Mets hosting Tampa Bay, shot of the Statue of Liberty, and Jay Payton, anything but a statue in the Mets outfield. In the second, Payton making the slide and grab. But in the third, pitcher, pitcher, Esteban Yan, his first major league swing. What is that? It's a home run off Bobby Jones. Ouch. The Mets get bombed. Another rough outing for Jones. 15 to 5, the final. Mets go down. In the Eastern League, the Rockcats playing a doubleheader with Portland. They lose the first 9 6. They win the second 10 5. A day night doubleheader, doubleheader for the Ravens. Both at Trenton, 9 to 1. And Norwich loses at Binghamton. Final there was 10 to 7. Still to come on this special edition, live from Rochester, New York, we'll have golf, NASCAR, and tennis highlights. Plus, we're going to hear from the original Wolfpack players who've been on the team since day one. You're watching Sunday Sports Replay. Monday on NBC 30, Connecticut News Today from 5 to 7 a.m. Childproofing when you're on the road. We'll have some summertime tips to make sure your family's next vacation is a safe one. Fatal fat. We'll show you why that extra belly flap could be an indicator of your future health. Join us for all the morning's news, live Skycam traffic with Rachel Lutzker, and my pinpoint forecast. Monday on NBC 30 Connecticut News Today from 5 to 7 a.m. Live, local, late breaking. This is a rental car. It's just a car, not even your car. So what's the big difference when you're choosing? Price. You search, get the rates, and what you're really looking for is a great car at a low rate. That's thrifty. Just the things you'd expect from a worldwide car rental company. Things like great cars, great service, airline miles, Blue Chip Express program, the works, and at a low rate. So the next time you need a rental car, call thrifty. Just what you want, just thrifty. It's that time of year. The taste of summer. Lots of ways every day. The taste of summer for you. Hey, New England. Find the biggest selection of fresh produce Shaw's Supermarkets has ever had. The taste of summer waiting for you. The taste of summer. It's all fresh for you. The taste of summer. And everything. And everything. The taste of summer. It's all fresh for you. Welcome back to this special edition of Sunday Sports Replay. Kevin Nathan reporting live from Rochester, New York, where the Hartford Wolfpack became Calder Cup champions tonight. Now, when the Wolfpack moved from Binghamton to Hartford in 1997, only four guys remained from that original lineup. We're talking about Dale Purton, P.J. Stock, Captain Ken Jernander, and Hamden's Todd Hall. Tonight's Calder Cup is especially sweet for these four guys. What does this mean? I mean, captain oh. three years went into this thing. It's, uh, we have so much invested right now, you can't believe, and uh, it all came together tonight. The guys were unbelievable, and it's everything you think it is. Is there anything in life that compares this? I mean, how good a feeling well, is winning a championship? Not in your hockey life, no. I mean, to say you're a champion, it can never be taken from you, and, I mean, we'll always have this. <laughs> three years of hard uh, work went into this. It's just, uh, you know, it's something finally paid off. I'm, Really glad for our captain, uh, Kenny Jernander, who's he's been through everything with this team, this organization, and something that pays off for someone like him, it's just fantastic. Is it tough winning on the road, or doesn't it matter? Uh, it was just great. We got a lot of fans here. It was on TV, too, so a lot of people are back home are celebrating this. My folks are watching, so everyone had a chance to share it with us. Have you ever experienced anything like this in your hockey life? I'd have to say no. This is unbelievable. I mean, this is what you... This is what you play hockey for. I mean, you know, high school championship, you know, it's a stepping stone to get here. I mean, on a professional level, there's no there's no feeling. Three years went into this for you with this organization. It doesn't get any better than this. Absolutely not. And I mean, the fan support we got over the last couple of games in Hartford, we averaged somewhere around 11, 11 and a half thousand. 
I mean, I, I, it's just a sign of great things to come. We'll have more on the Calder Cup champs coming up in the next segment. On to golf. Hey, golf's a sport the Wolfpack can now play. Now that the season's over, we show you the highlights from the Kemper Open. Justin Leonard on number nine with a long birdie putt. And Leonard would get it to fall. Put him at 11 under. He would finish second today. Your winner, Tom Shearer. He finishes at 13 under par. Shearer, your Kemper Open champion. On to NASCAR, the MBNA Platinum 400 in Dover, Delaware. Jeff Gordon having a tough season, bumps the wall. The Rainbow Warrior done for the day. The checkered flag on this one would belong to Tony Stewart. Stewart, your winner at the MBNA Platinum 400 at Dover Downs. At the French Open, no major surprises today. Venus Williams near court taking on Anka Huber. And Venus, a winner in straight sets. And Monica Sellis, who's going to play for the Hartford Fox Force this summer, taking on Emily Moresmo. And Monica wins in straight sets, 7-5, 6-3. Still to come on this special edition of Sunday Sports Replay, our Plays of the Week. Plus, carrying the cup home is nothing new for Hartford Wolfpack coach John Paddock. That story and more coming up next on Sunday Sports Replay. When it comes to half-ton towing capacity, Chevy Silverado beats any 4x4 V8 from Ford or Dodge. When it comes to size, Silverado has the biggest extended cab of any half-ton pickup. What'd you do to my truck? I just gave it a wash. And with an offer like this, we made a great truck look even better. Silverado, the truck from Chevy. A man's got to protect his image. I got my dad's pigweed pollen and my mom's kitten dander. I don't know where my mildew came from. Zyrtec treats both year-round indoor and outdoor allergies. And among leading prescription antihistamines, only Zyrtec is approved for kids as young as two years. To learn more about Zyrtec syrup and tablets, ask your child's doctor. In Zyrtec studies with children, side effects included drowsiness, headache, sore throat, and stomach ache. Most were mild or moderate. Zyrtec, lots of allergies, just one dose. Hello, I'm Lee Newton. Join me June 8th at 7.30 p.m. for the NBC 30 On Air Job Fair, a unique program highlighting job opportunities from some of Connecticut's fastest growing companies. Meet key decision makers and learn about opportunities in high tech, manufacturing, shipping, and more. And you'll also be able to log on to NBC30.com to interact with the participating companies. So whether you're looking for a job or you're just curious as to what's available, tune in Thursday, June 8th at 7.30 p.m. for the NBC 30 On Air Job Fair. Make room for the new Mucho Grande Nachos, only at Taco Bell. It's freaky deaky big, crazy butt bumping big. A stone cold Mucho Macho Monster that will rock your little world. You need to call a friend, bring a friend, Ooh, make a friend, because you're going to need backup. New Mucho Grande Nachos, only at Taco Bell. Mucho Mucho, baby. Welcome back to this special edition of Sunday Sports Replay. Wolfpack first-year coach John Paddock is no stranger to winning the Calder Cup. He set a record tonight, actually tied one, by being a part of his fifth Calder Cup championship, two as a player and three as a coach. Five times he won this thing. What does it mean the fifth time? One for the thumb. Uh, they, they, don't, they only get better. They don't get any worse. And, uh... It's the greatest feeling. I mean, I mean you can't, it's something you can't describe, but you can't, you can't feel or accomplish uh, elsewhere, you know, in another job because it's something that's, that's magnified and the mistakes are magnified and you're in the press and it's, it's just a great, great feeling. What made this team special? Why are they champions right now? Oh, uh, it's so many things to just capsize, capsize it, but, uh, you know, from the start they wanted to win and they were very attentive to doing everything they could to win. And, and uh, you know, we, when we make changes, got lines and so forth. They that never bothers them. Like they, they really had a great focus. Did you have knots in your stomach up until the last couple of minutes tonight, or? Uh, knots after the first because we had such a big lead. I mean, before that, I didn't have knots. I felt before the game we were going to win for sure. So. Still good winning on the road. I mean, there was a pretty good Harvard uh, contingent of fans here. Yeah, it doesn't matter as long as you got it. That's all that counts. No doubt about it. When we come back on this special edition of Sunday Sports Replay, our plays of the week. We'll be right back. On the next extra, one woman, 
three engagement rings and the jilted lovers who went to court to get them back. Miss Furin has a pattern and a history of stealing wedding rings. Now she speaks out in an extra exclusive. Were you trying to rip these guys off? Then, actress Andrea Thompson left the hit show NYPD Blue to be a small town reporter. Now her former co-stars review her TV news debut. Plus, why sexy Brazilian models are suddenly industry favorites. Next Extra. Monday night at 7, here on NBC 30. Is wrong. Hello, lady. But the way they do it. You wanna go for a ride? Oh yes. Feels so right. Go. Sixty seconds. Rated PG-13. Starts to night. At first glance, it looks like a very large burger. At second glance, the craving hits you, and you wrap your mouth around our new colossal burger. Big, juicy, grilled to tasty perfection, and you'll find it only at the new Friendlies. Hi, welcome to the new Friendlies. When the story breaks, experience makes the difference. The latest in a series of... Here at the state capitol today, lawmakers undertaking... At Bradley International Airport, I'm just... The political With the state's most experienced team of reporters and anchors, NBC 30 Connecticut News is there. Covering the streets of Connecticut, bringing live, local, late-breaking news of the day, home to you. NBC 30 Connecticut News, your source for live, local, late-breaking news coverage. Welcome back to this special edition of Sunday Sports Replay. Now, just because I'm live out here in Rochester, New York, covering the Calder Cup Finals, doesn't mean we're not going to get Kevin Seven tonight. Some of the guys in the sports department labored hard today, and here's what they came up with. It's Kevin Seven this week with help from the movie For the Love of the Game. With Kevin in Rochester, the sports department decided to put our heads together and come up with our own Kevin Seven. How are you going to manage that? Very carefully. A couple of minutes ago. Hi, y'all. <laughs> we thought we'd start with the national pastime. You like baseball? Who doesn't? With plays like this. Fly ball to deep center field, and Cameron going back to the track, to the wall, makes the leap, and makes the catch! Wow. Well, a high fly to left. That ball hit well. Langford still backing up all the way to the wall. Hit hard into left center field. Sexton, Sexton, Sexton dives, and what a play by Richie Sexton. Look, this is crazy. Back well to left center field. Andrew Jones cuts back for this one, dives, and he got it. Whoa. Line to right field, Derek Bell going back, and he makes a diving catch. Pulled to left field. Gonzalez can watch it. It is caught at the wall. It's a great game. Sure is. And here's hoping we can do a great Kevin Seven. Number seven, Indy winner Juan Montoya attempts to throw out the first pitch at a Yankees game. Indianapolis 500. Yeah, he's got plenty of speed there, too. His control on the track was a bit better. Guess that looked pretty funny out there today, huh? Number six, the Expos Vlad Guerrero gets a little carried away with his arm strength. He's going to wave in bonds. Guerrero's got the cannon. If it gets any worse, I'll sit down. Number five, Reggie Miller buries a few threes and buries the Knicks in the process. Freewell steps back and delivers another three. Reggie Miller with another dagger. This ain't your day. Oh, Indiana wins game six, 93 to 80. Number four, some genius jumps 30 feet out of the stands at Yankee Stadium, luckily landing on a net above home plate. God, I hate Yankee fans. Number three, the A's Randy Velarde gets an unassisted triple play. Spencer right to Velarde, and this will be a rare triple play. An unassisted triple play. You gotta be kidding. Number two, Pedro Martinez and Roger Clemens put on a show at Yankee Stadium. One and two. And 
Miss Kitty for the strikeout. We never had to fake it. But it's Trot Nixon who gets the last lap. Deep and on its way. It is no longer a scoreless game. A two-run homer for Trot Nixon. That hurts. And number one, the Hartford Wolfpack win the Calder Cup. Three seconds, two seconds, one second. And how do you like this, Hartford? The Hartford Wolfpack are the AHL champions. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. Certainly a special night for Hartford hockey. The Wolfpack win the Calder Cup in game six, four to one. And what a 15 or 16 months it's been for Connecticut sports. 1999, the UConn men win it all. The CBA champion pride from a year ago, the UConn women, and now the Wolfpack. Four champs in a little over a year, not bad. The Wolfpack en route back to Hartford. Still no plans in terms of parades or celebrations. Let the guys enjoy themselves tonight. I'm sure the Wolfpack will let us know tomorrow what their plans are for a celebration. Reporting live from Rochester, New York, where the Calder Cup is won by the Hartford Wolf Pack tonight. I'm Kevin Nathan. Thanks for watching Sunday Sports Replay. Have a great week, everybody.